Hello, everyone. We are finally here. <laughs> um, having uh, taken some sick leave, essentially. Yeah, sorry, guys. I was under the weather and have been falling asleep at like 8 p.m. every single night and we don't do these until later than 10 usually because we have to get kids down and i mean hey we're done. starting at like nine o'clock this time oh so man this is super early for yeah, us Yeah, we're getting a good start here yep, well hopefully my voice lasts throughout this whole thing i'm still i'm still a little a little uh, gross i believe in sick, you but we're gonna make we're gonna uh, make the best of it. Um, if you All want, right. I can take some of the longer reviews. Sounds good. Let's let's start with some reviews then. All um, right. All right, Ethan Kyronis. We haven't heard from him in a while. Yeah. Hot well, there could be worse people for Kudai to meet in the hospital. I know this is going to stay kind of dark for a while, but is the darkness going to get a little less intense anytime soon? It's starting to remind me of why I quit trying to complete my watch the Code Gas 17 Code episodes. Geass, Code Geass 17 episodes in I already knew the full pilot. The flu, the full knew plot. the full plot. See, that's, you need to read because I can't see that at all. It's funny. too it's um, too much of an angle. I mean, I would say, yeah, the darkness gets less intense pretty quickly here. Yeah, I think yeah, so too. Yeah, I, was, I, like, I don't know that I'd say things move in a more like strictly lighthearted direction. But definitely not as it's mentally taxing. No, yeah. Definitely not as mentally taxing, okay. I would say. Um, the big airy, little airy issues are reminding me of all the Lucina jokes, including a funny fan comic. I think I know which one you're talking about. Like, the one that comes to mind is where Crom grounds adult Lucina and you see her, like, hanging out in her room with, like, her baby self who's, like, in a crib. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one that's that I'm thinking. That's the one that I'm thinking of. Um, but that, yeah, that I, I can definitely see. I can definitely see the parallels there. That's funny. <laughs> nice. All right. Thank, thank you, you for your review, Ethan Caronis. Joe Clone. This airy chapter delivers. Yes. It's great to have a glimpse of her mindset as she goes through day to day life now that is so drastically changed. Yeah, I wanted to. I, I kind of wanted to take a minute for Ari and be like, not everything involved, not everything involving her is like doom and gloom in the yeah. apocalypse and all that. <laughs> her perspective is also pretty ingenious when you introduce Teen Juniper because not only do we meet her, meet them here, but Ari gives us future knowledge on what they became in her timeline. Yeah, I enjoyed doing that because this was a really unique way for me to be able to like let you guys know like what like what became of these guys in the future without her having to spell it out to other people because we're in her headspace. Mm. So it's like, th like this is who these people are to her. But like, that's not, that, that, that wasn't something that really needed to come up in conversation with anybody else. So because I had this chapter, I had opportunities to explain things like that. Mm. Of course, Piero would speak the best Japanese out of all the Americans. Oh, absolutely. Her work ethic is as strong or stronger than Ida and Yai Rozu combined. I don't know if I would go that far, actually. I think that she's just perfect, and she can do it effortlessly better than the two of them combined. There is some of that, yeah. Like, <laughs> there's no doubt that she has a strong work ethic. I would say that out of the bunch of them, either Jean or Weiss has the strongest work ethic. Because yeah, if you think I, about it, Jean, has to, Jean starts from nothing, basically. In my opinion, Pira is just naturally wonderful and talented and everything <laughs> and that's why she's just the calm gracious person she is because everything just comes so natural to her and she's so kind and she's just that's she's just magical i when, love pira when, when, yeah when ruby was going on just as becca was starting to get into it they killed pira so becca's like nope i'm done i was so mad i watched i watched for a while after you watched that for a little while after that yeah but yeah pira was my favorite and yeah. i got so upset anyway I, there, was a, there was a kind of a cool scene in Ruby Ice Queendom, which honestly was a mid anime, but um, there was a cool scene where they had her singing the Mirror Mirror song because it's in that like they're in Weiss's head, so like we see what she thinks of everybody, um, and in her head, like Pierre is the one who's who should be like doing the the performing uh, and all that. That's funny. Yeah, I really felt kind of emotional during her scene with All Might. Just him on the verge of tears always gets me. Aw. You and me both, buddy. <laughs> and then when they discuss all for one, we snap right back into fearing for our lives. How did he die in the future? Is her explanation just the presented story as she knew it? We know the real deal in the official story. I wonder. Um. How how did uh, how did he die in the future? Yeah. Uh, how did how did? No, that is that that's how all for one died. Like straight like straight up. He, um. He was he was killed he was killed by the he was killed by the Tartarus security measures 
um, the day that uh, the day that uh, the Paranormal Liberation Front made their move in the future. That date has now changed in this timeline. Mm. Um, and you know, as far as they know, all for one's still alive. So who knows if that's still the case or not? Um, but yeah, in the in the timeline that Future Area comes from. Yeah, All for One was was killed by the security measures of Tartarus hmm. um, the day that uh, everything started going down. Huh. Of course you name Kudai's counselor the same as your made-up name for Sachi. More SAO love is always appreciated. I was wondering if someone was going to catch that. <laughs> Seems like an interesting path he's going to try to go, but will life actually let him go there? Next time in Your Hero Academia. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know how this works. All right, Joe Clone. Thank you, Joe Clone, for your review. Let's see. I'm going to let you take Silver's because I'm already messing up on people's Uh, reviews and his is long. All right, let's see. So Silver4700 writes, Nina, you you brought Kurdai back to me, and even if that makes me selfish, it makes you my hero. Silver, really? Because it makes you my villain, you freaking villain. (laughs) So that hate's not going away anytime soon. (laughs) An interesting idea that's not that's only touched on and not really expanded upon is the idea of being taken away from everything you know and put in a completely new situation. We see a small glimpse of this with Ari when thinking about her sense of loss for her future friends, but it's admittedly a bit disappointing that we don't see a whole lot of that. Or maybe we will. I don't know. I mean, yeah, we've we like I know the story's been going on for a long time, so like within the context of that, future Ari hasn't really been part of the gang for too long. Mm. Um, so there's room there, there's certainly room for that to continue. And aside, but that's one of the reasons why I love the film Spirited Away. It does an excellent job of making Chihiro, and by extension, the viewer, feel more isolated and alone. Yeah. I haven't seen Spirited Away, so I'll I know. Take your He's word uncultured. For it. That's actually, you know. I'm an, uncultured swine. We're, I'm actually not a huge Hayao Miyazaki fan, not because I dislike it, it's just not my favorite genre, but I have seen a quite a bit of spirited away and i Mm -hmm. haven't seen i've never actually seen the whole thing in one sitting um i just saw bits and pieces growing up um but from what i've seen i definitely get what you're talking about okay something that i'm experimenting with in my wind waker story again something that will probably never be finished i curse myself just do it man i mean i relate so hard like there's stories that i there's stories that i always want to start and then like i don't know how to finish them so i'm just like i Mm -hmm. yeah i can't go on with this let's see if I'm being honest, maybe I've had my expectations for the story all wrong. Reading the, reading this chapter especially, I genuinely don't know what the focus is, or maybe I'm just blind. Is it a power fantasy with the strongest heroes like Kurdai, Deku, and Eri completely wrecking everything? Is it a slice of life with hero work on the side with how much characters can interact in what I call fluff, in which case it isn't fluff? Is it an action battle story? Is it a coming of age? It's certainly not something like the literary Greek epics that take pages upon pages to make characters and events, because largely, you kind of know what the end goal of these stories are. In the Odyssey, it's ultimately for Odysseus to get home. I actually did read the Iliad in the Odyssey um, when I was in when I was in high school. Um, uh, let's see. Aside from defeat Shigaraki, there's no really no clear end goal with this story. I mean, that's part of the end goal. I mean, to me, like a good story, like especially if it's written in a novel format and not a TV format, it should encompass a grand majority of those mm. things. Because like you, if, if you want to be able to relate to these characters, you like how, how do I how do I put this like there's a lot of stories where you can relate to a character on one aspect or another maybe two but to me the ones that stand out in particular are the ones where i can relate to the character in the majority of their aspects Mm. like i'm not talking about like you know being able to wield magic and sword fighting and all that but like you know in combat and stuff you know i can relate to that you know having been having having been in rounds of fisticuffs so like obviously not to the point of like you know trying to hack each other to pieces with swords and stuff but, like, I can relate to that part. I can relate to teenagers coming of age. I can relate to them, like, you know, just wanting to get away from, you know, everything that's going on and wanting to take a break. So there's those slice of life moments. But there is a larger goal that I do want to pursue. And, you know, I relate to that as well. And that's part of their hero journey. So the fact that all these things are being presented in this story, to me at least, is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that's uh, maybe that's too detracting away from the... Maybe that's distracting away from the... Uh, from the main goal which is you know the downfall of the villains essentially um well when you when you first came to me about the plot of this story you told me it was you know your question was what if there was a nomu who didn't want to be a nomu didn't want to be a nomu Mm -hmm. and that was your that was your whole point when you first came up with the story yeah i Um, think it's evolved beyond that yeah definitely yeah definitely yeah i mean 
I don't know. Yeah. I think you're just enjoying the craft at this point and just trying to see where it goes. Yeah. So. Yeah, there is definitely some of that. Um, let's see. Silver goes on to say, here's the thing. A story can have all these elements, but if I'm being blunt, I suppose that after three or four years, I don't really know what the core focus is. Uh, hero's journey. Okay. Um, if, if, you need a, if you need a core focus, it's a hero's journey. Let's see. Ari, I'm Cronoa, the temporal heroine. I'll be the hero who turns back the hands of time for those who endure tragedy. Grovile, you travel back in time to save a ruined future and you're hailed as a hero. I travel back in time to save a ruined future and I'm branded as a world-ending villain. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> Lucina, you're stealing pieces of time itself, sending areas into perpetual stasis. Grovile, to end a world perpetual stasis, you cherry-picking, name-stealing, concept-appropriating loser. Go stop the unaliving <laughs> of your precious egg salt. Oh, wait. <laughs> and you, points to Ari. You didn't have the right hand of the god of time chasing you to the past trying to stop you, did you? I'll stop it. So that's a that's a Pokemon dungeon. Uh, that's a Pokemon Dungeons uh, explorers of uh, times uh, of uh, explorers of time, sky, and space reference. Uh, it's a plot line. I'll oh. have to explain that to you off camera. Okay. It's a very convolute. It's a very convoluted plot line <laughs> for a ch especially for a children's game. I have to say. Interesting. Um. Let's see. Um. We have the introduction of Juniper. In the four paragraphs I've read so far, I currently feel the same thing, same about them as I did in the show. Not very strongly. Maybe that will change. I'll wait, though. Yeah, just give it time. I, You know me. I, I love a slow burn. Yeah. For me, when there's this many characters, I just treat it like fairy tale. There's characters who I sporadically kind of care about, but then I get back to the main ones. I'm like, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in this story, I would say there's like six or seven characters that are like the main focus. Mm -hmm. Um... Like, you know, Kurai, Mina, Deku, Ochako. Well, maybe even maybe even not Ochako as much. Like, So I suppose secondary to that would be like Ochako, Bakugo, Todoroki. And now Aries kind of come into mm. things as like part of the Lock main group. Lakarui is more of the main part of the main group than... Yeah, I suppose. So. Well, like, he's like, in the grand scheme of things, he's not been in very many chapters. That's true. Like, he, he certainly is a prevalent, he's a very, he's a very marked presence but mm. whenever he does appear but he's like in the grand scheme of things he's not in that much hmm. like he's gonna be in a lot more going forward yeah but up to now he's been in like maybe a dozen or maybe a few more chapters out of like 90 something dang so yeah uh let's see in my notes verbatim imagine using tri trigonometry from high school to find a job in the real world <laughs> <laughs> I joke about this a lot, but in seriousness, I think part of my frustration with this new section of the story surrounding Kai's death can be summed up with a quote from Pirates 3. Barbosa's. Bar let's see, Barbosa. Still thinking of running, Jack? Think you can outrun the world? You know the problem with being the last of anything? By and by, there will be none left at all. Jack. Sometimes things come back, mate. We're living proof, you and me. Aye, but that's a gamble of long odds, ain't it? There's never a guarantee of coming back. But passing on, that's dead certain. Reflecting on it, I don't think my overall issue is that Kurt I came back. I think that his, that the story's recent chapters made it feel like he had to come back. Whether that he had to stop the literal apocalypse or to help his friends turn around from their sad, sad and slump, or even just to bring back the big MacGuffin. Um, how do I put this? Like, he he said it himself. He did not need to come back. Ari made a mistake. He. he he, he addressed it basically as Aaron made a mistake because she brought back one for all. They needed one for all to beat Shigaraki. So from his point of view, it was a mistake to bring him back. That's still where his head is. That's still where his head, his head, like he's making progress, but his head space is still that it was a mistake to bring him back. Well, from my point of view. <laughs> I was Sorry. like, no, it's okay. Um, so yeah, so yeah. For, so, for me. Yeah, it was, it was the result, it was the result of a character not thinking things through. Mm. Like, which is annoying. As Which many is annoying, times but people do that. It, yep. Sorry, the dog distracted me. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. Did you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean... <sighs> Sorry, I'm so tired. I forgot what we were talking about. Talking about uh, Kodai being brought back and oh. the... And then, like, like yeah. what? Like, he, he, what, what was that last bit he said? So I think this story's recent chapters made it feel like he had to come back, whether that was because he had to stop the literal apocalypse to help his friends turn around from a big and sad slump, or even just to bring back the big MacGuffin. Mm. It wasn't for the last two reasons. Yeah, so I think, for me, this is where I'm at. Like, 
there I don't know if you ever have this, but there's movies where no matter how many times I watch them, there there's a mistake that's made, mm-hmm. and I just cringe every time because a little piece of me unrealistically just hopes that they won't make that mistake, even yeah. though I'm, I've seen the movie. Like and when Edmund's like, walking to the White Witch's castle? Yeah, when Edmund walks to the White Witch's castle, or when Miles breaks the goober, or, you know, there's just like a big oof that yeah. happens at some point mm-hmm. and it's like if they didn't do that things would be a lot Difference. different yeah. and for me that's where it is and it's mm-hmm. like it's not necessarily you know it's not something that's good that happened it just yeah. happened whether we like it or not yeah. and it's a twist that forces the story to take a different direction than you expected yeah and so i don't know that's like i'm trying to think because i feel like there was a movie we watched recently where I just had to walk away because I couldn't do it. What was it? Um, what was it? I don't even know. No, was it, was it a show? I don't even know. No. Never mind. I'll come up with it uh, later. You, 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 I'm you'll, slow you'll, today, remember soon yeah. you, you'll remember as soon as you yeah. stop recording. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's see. Silver goes on to say, I genuinely apologize because I don't mean to keep going back to this issue. It's stupid on my end, but I just keep thinking about it. It's not even that he changed on a fundamental level. It's just that everyone, specifically in Class 1A, just kind of got a free pass, for lack of a better word. I don't know. I hate that I keep thinking about this. I mean, hey, let me, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the point of this whole exercise for me is, like, if it bothers you this much that you keep coming back to it, you know, clear, you know clearly something, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I got, a, I got a genuinely strong emotional reaction from you, so that can go either mm-hmm. way for me. Un grano. So in, in, in Spanish, you say someone has un grano or there's something like the piece of sand on the tongue of the clam mm-hmm. that bothers them and bothers them until, until a curl, it curl comes. comes. That's, that's kind of what that reminds me of because it's like, well, and that's why a lot of people write fanfics because there'll be something that happens and it just irks them and they keep their brain keeps going back to it and then... You know, either creativity comes out of it or it's just there, you know. And so, and I think that a lot of stories will do that, um, whether for good or bad. Yeah. But you have that, you know, un grano. It's like yeah. <laughs> thinking, you can't stop thinking about it. Sometimes you'll say I you, it, it, that instead of having a craving for something too. Yeah. It's it's a double entendre for that. Interesting. But um, yeah, that's, I get you, buddy. There's <laughs> stories that do that with me. And yeah, Let's see. Oh. <clears throat> except I'm not creative like you guys. I mean, so I appreciate I don't you guys' honesty. Yeah. Like that to me is the important part. Also, I'm not creative like you guys. So if, <laughs> if I was creative like you guys, I'd just go with it and just fanfic myself to death. But I can't write <laughs> fanfic. So that's, that's why you do this. Let's see. Um, let's see. It says, I wrote the following late at night while I was rather tired. Didn't know if I should keep it in, but I decided that I wanted to. Uh oh. Let's see. How? How do you do this? I know I've asked you several times before, but I just can't wrap my head around how you're able to write this much. And not only write this much, but write this well. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> it's he hard. couldn't decide whether to keep the compliment in there. Yeah, he, okay, and I, I see how it is. <laughs> he's, he's nicer when he's tired. He's overtired. There it is. Uh, <laughs> let's see. It's hard for me to simply sit down and write character interactions or descriptions of events or anything without hitting a wall. And if I'm being blunt, it's impressive, inspiring, and infuriating at the same time. I mean, honestly, mate, like... I have a like I have a wonderful sounding board is what I is is what helps me to get past all that stuff. Also, I think you genuinely enjoy writing. Oh yeah. It's an emotional it's a way of emotionally venting. Like for me, I enjoy writing. Like I can do it and mm-hmm. I can do it well if I force myself mm-hmm. to, but it's not something that I just want to do. Yeah. Like whenever you have downtime, you are almost always writing or or drawing or, drawing or yeah. editing. For me, it's like I enjoy painting. And I can sit down and I can, if I have nothing to do, which rarely happens, that's what I want to sit down and do. And I, you know, and other people don't get that because it stresses them out because they're perfectionists and they don't want it, you know. But for, I think that's just your a creative outlet. That's how you let off steam. And I mean, I didn't get so, to, I didn't get to being this, I'll call it capable because my words are failing me at the moment. I, I, I wasn't capable of this, you know, from the beginning, you know, I had, it, it took me a while to get here. Would you say it? Would you say it's more discipline or more of a drive to want to do it to create? It's honestly, it's a hybrid of both. Yeah. Like, like the discipline aspect comes in the sense that like I don't just take off. Like the the, the, the discipline is something that I that I 
learned over time when I back when I was writing like five different stories at the same time you know I burned myself out Mm -hmm. um whereas with this you know I'm I maintain the discipline of like yeah I can start up some other ideas but I like I'll get them started and then I'll shelve them so that I can come back to them Mm -hmm. when I have a proper motivation for them and that way I can keep working on this for them like the the, the, so like the the creative desire is still there for sure Mm -hmm. but I have to exercise some discipline in how I use it okay so I would say it's a hybrid of, of both. Right. Um, I don't know if that's a good way to explain it. No, yeah, it makes sense. Because, I mean, that's the thing. I think for creative people, it's it's that's a really interesting line to find. Yeah. You know, whether you have a desire. Because just because you have a desire to create doesn't necessarily mean you have the drive or the intentionality. Yeah. And for me, I rarely create my own work. Unless someone puts a deadline on me and says, hey, I want to commission you to do X, Y, or Z. I'm like, okay. Then I have a deadline. Then I can force myself to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's like I often have that desire to create, but I have no drive. I have no ideas. So I just kind of sit there, you know, and I sit and I sit on it. And I think a lot of creatives are like that where we we have the creativity but we just don't have the energy the emotional energy to put into it Mm. whether it's because of other jobs or other priorities um and i think it just it's where you spend your time because i find okay i could sit down and actually make a list of ideas and start working on something or I could sit, open up Pinterest in the guise of coming up with an idea and then scroll for three hours and go to sleep, <laughs> you know? And so it's, I think, you know, depending on where you're at in life, where you're at with your creativity, you have to decide what your priorities are and what time you're going to carve out. Because I feel like before we had kids, mm-hmm. you would like actually carve out specific times in your day often to write and you say yeah. you'd tell me too you'd be like hey honey i know you want you know we're gonna hang out at this time we're gonna do this together i'm carving out this time to write yeah. and you do still do that sometimes sometimes um but usually it's i also more, have an office to retreat mm-hmm. into yeah now it's more like whenever you can when i can <laughs> whenever you can you'll sit down and start proofreading something or typing yeah. something up um but i think just what I, the, depending on your schedule and what your life looks like you have to kind of come up with those priorities and I was actually I was listening to a focus on the family podcast the other day because that's what I do on my way to work Mm -hmm. and there's this woman who does a blog call and it's it's funny because it's just like I think it's like thrifty mom or money saving mom or something like that and she talked about how like as human beings we only really have the emotional energy for five basic priorities Hmm. And so it's like you have to do the self-care. You have to do, obviously, the mandatory jobs. Um, You have to care for other people in your life. Mm -hmm. And those are, like, going to be the three big ones. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you have to figure out what your other two priorities are. And you can't do everything in one day. You have to pick one or two per day. Mm -hmm. And so what her advice to people who want to be more proactive and intentional about getting things done Mm -hmm. is you make a list of those five priorities. Obviously, self-care, care for others, and, like, just basic life stuff, like, go getting up going to work Mm -hmm. those are you know those have to be in there but the other two you have to you know do i really care about having a super clean organized house well that's going to be one of them i'm going to have to do that once or twice a week at least Mm -hmm. you know and then that fifth one that's going to be like whether it's running a business or having a creative outlet and you have to just be intentional okay every day you don't have to necessarily have it planned out in advance, but you have to say, okay, what one or two priorities do I have today? And you just focus mm-hmm. on those. And the more you practice, the more you get into that routine and the more natural it becomes to have that drive because otherwise it's hard to be disciplined. Mm-hmm. And sorry I went on this tangent, but that's no, just where I'm at. No, it's, it's, it, sounds like, it sounds like an answer to... Yeah. Yeah, like I, like I didn't know that was a thing. So like I don't... Personally I think you just that, naturally do that's that. Just how I, that's just how I function. You just naturally do that because okay. you're always like, you know, because I hear you do it whether you realize it or not because you'll mm-hmm. be like, well, tomorrow, Becca, we need to pay this bill. I need to do this and this. So you'll usually list and I've noticed that you will say one or two things that you need to do hmm. for the following day. 
Hmm. And you usually will get one of the two things done, if not both. Interesting. And like whether you do it intentionally, you do it almost every day. In the evening, huh. you'll say, well, Becca, I think I need to do this tomorrow and this because this is going on. Yeah. And generally, you're really good at being productive and getting those things done. Me being not super self-driven, <laughs> I struggle with that. And so, that, excuse me, that's something I'm working on. If I can go to work and do my job and come home and survive and kind of keep the kids alive... That's as much as I can do on those days. But, you know, I'm trying to be more intentional about like, yeah. you know, how can I help you with the housework? How can I help you with other like ways of saving money in our lives or, you know, having downtime and like prioritizing your spouse or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, I don't know, that's something that I thought was really int like really helpful for me mm -hmm. just because I have a similar struggle with actually being able to sit down and create quality um I mean, art uh, quality, quality yeah i don't want to i don't want to say content because i was just we have a friend who mm -hmm. recently was talking about how he hates the word content hmm. because it cheapens the art forms right oh yeah so yeah. your friend chris the other day yeah, he posted yeah. about how he hates when people call creative media content because it's just like Words are important it's, to people. Well, yeah, it's, it's cheapening what we're making. When you call, like, you know. When you call it content. When you call it content. When someone's, if somebody spent hours and hours and hours of their life writing the script for a show, mm -hmm. just for it to be, you know, in and out, barely digested and gone, mm -hmm. what's the point of that? Yeah. It's not art. It needs to be something that actually has meaning and actually has impact, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I'm trying to get away from using that word too because I'm like, yeah, you know what? If you're being intentional and creating something that actually matters in this world, you want it to have meaning, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not just your everyday in and out, forget in five seconds content like you yeah. watched a reel, okay. you know, that you forgot right. and then you rediscover it two I, weeks I later. I saw that post, but I honestly yeah. didn't think too much into yeah. it. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, really long tangent, but I just, Silver, I thought that was a really interesting question. Yeah. And I, that's something I've been struggling with myself. And I do that same thing. He reads to me and I'm like, how do you do that? How? But people respond to my art the same way too. So <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes. I can tell the coffee's uh, kicking in. It is. It finally <laughs> metabolized. Go ahead. Uh, we no can worries. continue with that review. No worries. Uh, it's almost finished. Let's see. Um, Silver finishes by saying, if I'm being perfectly honest with myself, I really like Ari. Maybe it's just because I relate to her a lot without getting too in-depth and keeping it brief, I internalize. So it's good to see a character that I can relate to in that regard. Hey, we got one in there. <laughs> Overall, I re do really love this airy centric chapter and I don't have a reference. Sorry. Have Yay. a great day. I mean, hey, you had that Pirates 3 reference, man, so that counts. Yeah. I'm glad he's enjoying it a little more now. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for pushing through, buddy. I know I sometimes it's that. hard. That's our skill in and of itself. When you're reading a story and you want to just quit just to push through, I'm bad about that. I'll get mad at a chapter and then I'm like, I'm over it. Done. Bye. And I throw the book and I never open it again. <laughs> I'm, I'm notorious at that. So thanks for hanging in there, buddy. All right. Atomical review. I was too hung up on the fact that Silver likes to, to write essays for quote unquote reviews. <laughs> and I don't remember exactly what happened in this chapter aside from the fact that I did very much like this one. So more than the previous ones. More so than the, more previous. So than the previous ones, actually. Oh, yeah. Not sure why. Indecisive. Itamira. <laughs> what a mood. What a mood. What Atomical. A mood. Hey, girl, you finished all your exams. You're just, you, 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 you just enjoy that moment. It's okay. You don't have to think too hard about it. One of my, one of my mates, he's, uh, he's, he, he's just finished studying in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, uh, so he's from Australia and uh, I was having a talk with him the other day and I was, I was, he, he was like, yeah, I'm go he's like, I'm going back to, he's like, I'm going back down under in, uh, in October. I was like, all right. So, I was like, oh, okay, so you're going to go backpack for a bit then? He's <laughs> like, how'd you know? I'm like, Tom, you're Australian. There's one of two things you're going to do. You're either going to go hit up dive bar with your friends or you're going to go backpacking for a month. <laughs> he was like, I hate that you're profiling me, but you're right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. Well, hey, we have, as a, one of our other friends in the Commonwealth, congratulations on finishing yes. the term. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. Silly Kita. All right, Silly Kita. Let's see. Silly Kita says, sorry I didn't post a review last chapter. Was taking some time off for a yeah, camping trip. Fine. What's that? Oh, I was responding to him, not you. Oh, okay. It's like taking some time off for a camping trip. Ooh, fun. Yeah. Let's see. Where'd you go? Um, let's see. A lot of good places to camp. Um, 
let's see. But now that I'm back, let's begin by covering a full chapter on my favorite sassy boy. <laughs> the opening scene did something that you seem to work hard toward in each chapter, that being the expression of multiple moods and tones at a time. And you did it in only a page or so. I'm referring to the fact that Kurt Eye's bad mood slash attitude made me laugh as he essentially dismantled the nurse's lecture. Um, I love seeing scenes like this where it's all too clear that he and Akuru are very much brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, when the source of his snark was revealed, I immediately got a major case of the sad because, ouch. I hadn't even thought about it up to now, but I believe that it's either mentioned in the story or you made a note of it on the podcast that Kurt Eye's birthday is synonymous with New Year's. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that in a podcast a, yeah. a, a few months back. Uh, let's see. I think that even if I had kept that knowledge at the forefront of my mind, I would have been too distracted by everything else that had been going on with him to make use of that information. Um, yeah, that was kind of I, I, that was kind of the idea. Hmm. like like although it wasn't like it's not like it was difficult in a sense because there just was a lot going on yeah i kind of wanted it to be a little bit out of left field it's like oh yeah it's his birthday but i i'm pretty sure that i had established that in the story at some point as well yeah um but it's just like it's just kind of like one of those things that, like oh it comes up in conversation and then you move on you forget about it but then you go back later and realize oh this was mentioned because of this well i mean that's i mean that's a good skill though and i'm glad you're practicing that you know yeah. because that's what makes stories have good reread value harry when potter's you, really good yeah that, that was i was about to say that it's it's interesting that you reread those books recently because mm -hmm. you reread it and you're like oh my gosh they mentioned that a big barn owl just swooped in. I wonder that must have been Malfoy's owl returning yeah. because Malfoy just. Yeah, they them mentioned out it like so in the so. first book is the only time that they mentioned that Malfoy owns a barn owl, mm -hmm. and then like from then on, it's like oh, yeah, or a barn owl yeah. goes over to the Slytherin table. Yeah, yeah, and so it's like you actually can. There's a lot of little tiny details that seem like world building mm -hmm. that actually are pertinent to the plot, mm -hmm. and so I think that's that's a skill that she you know like or hate J.K. Rowling, mm -hmm. I personally like her um she's that's a skill that she has that i think makes those that's why those books have been so timeless yeah and so many gener like not so many generations but you know quite a few generations between when they came out and now have really enjoyed them and continue to enjoy them because they have that solid reread value and you just find more little details that she hid uh, because she, clearly she had a plan from the get-go and she was able to hide these little easter eggs and nuggets and i think that's i'm glad that you're working on yeah. that because i'm really looking forward to see how you yeah, apply I, it in your i enjoy story, novels with a reread value yeah. especially i well i mean i think aragon's another example that that really oh, yeah. there's a lot of little little details that you like may in not the pick fourth chapter or something you see the final scene of the book mm. of, the, of the book series because mm -hmm. he has that vision yep and like, and you, like you could pass it off as like, oh, maybe it's like, maybe it's just him having a dream. Maybe it's mm -hmm. him. Maybe it's like early stages of magic. And then like he keeps having the dream throughout. And then you realize when you get to it, mm -hmm. it's the final scene of the yeah, book. Yeah. And I think I like it because, you know, art is about intentionality. Yes. And if you're just sitting there splattering paint on the wall, you're just splattering paint on the wall. Mm -hmm. But when you have the context, that's when it has meaning, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Is it a banana taped to a wall or is it a, is it a stance on, you know, the world at large or whatever, or art itself, you mm -hmm. know? And so the whole point that it goes back to that whole question of what is art and either way I'll make fun of somebody who tapes a banana oh, to a wall absolutely. and calls it art. Absolutely. Or, you know, you just stick a toilet in a, in an art museum and people are going to sit there staring at it because if it has the context of being art you think there has to be a purpose yeah. and there has to be a meaning and so when a when an author doesn't just go in blind and they actually have that plan mm -hmm. it's a lot more clear yeah. when when you go back and reread yeah. so that's i mean that's a skill i think every writer should work on yeah yeah. I'm the kind like, who just goes in. I'll have an idea and I go in blind, and then I get to my climax. I'm like, uh, now what? <laughs> yeah. No, I. Yeah, yeah. I. I I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm glad that that's being picked up on because I have been. I have been trying to work on that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. And concerning bigger things than just than yeah. uh, than just a birthday thing. Like yeah. th Like there are there are things that I've been dropping. Oh hints yeah. Towards. I, in this this time that you're reading to me because I know you read me. 
you know, previ previous iterations of these chapters mm -hmm. ages ago. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice because I've forgotten a lot of it, but I'm remembering as you're reading it. But a lot of things have also changed as you've gone in and edited things mm -hmm. on a bi-weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting to me how you add little things. And now that I know about certain plot twists down the line, mm -hmm. I'm noticing some of you're these seeing the little signs details. That are like, th I think this coming chapter actually has one of those for yeah, me. Yeah, I, I think can't, so. I can't can't mention what it is but yeah. um it definitely this coming chapter definitely has a little easter egg mm -hmm. um for down the road oh yeah so oh yeah it's a fun one mm -hmm. um let's it's see. an infuriating one you mean for me <laughs> for you oh they'll love it they'll, they'll, love, love it. they'll eat it up oh yeah when they get to, when they get to it to I, th understand I, th it. I think they will i think they will let's see um all right now for events concerning the best side character on fanfic yep <laughs> I loved all his interactions with the characters in his chapter. We've gotten a fair amount of them up to now, but getting to see them from his point of view is fairly new. I know we got some of that during the chapter following Kurdai's death, but I feel like we're really getting reacquainted with how he used to be. We've certainly been able to talk to him throughout the story, but speaking is one, only one facet of a person's personality. A lot is added in us being able to see his mannerisms and how he physically interacts with his surroundings and circumstances under his own power, and I love it. Him trying to sass Aizawa was probably the funniest thing to happen in the story in quite some time. Like, he's clearly the more intelligent person between the two of them, but that matches up to absolute zero when you're a child facing off with Eraserhead. <laughs> Glad to see that Akuri still has enough humility, even if just barely, to recognize that his ass was about to be in the fire. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. You do not mess with you do not mess with, with Shota Aizawa. Uh-uh. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Akaduri versus May. This is very close in the running for funniest scene in the chapter because, of course, the two genius children cannot cope with one another. <laughs> Given how their interactions progress throughout the chapter, I think we'll start seeing them getting along at some point. But their dynamic is introduced pretty quickly and very well. I had absolutely no trouble buying into their butting heads the second they meet. And Power Loader just kicking them out of the lab because he couldn't deal with them was both because he couldn't deal with them both was entirely believable. That poor man has enough to deal with and Hatsume constantly blowing things up. Gosh, I wish we could just kick kids out of class in America. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? It's like, you're not contributing to the educational environment. Bye! Thanks, Bush. <sighs> no child left behind. <sighs> well, see, and that's, that's, that's inequitable because I'm, you know, if, if, if I'm not meeting the needs of this child who's, uh -huh. who's being distracting uh -huh. then i'm not doing my job even though that child is preventing everyone else in the room from learning <sighs> it's a thing but I, I i better stop where i while i'm ahead <laughs> <laughs> let's see i actually have to say it was interesting to watch awkward get knocked down a few pegs by multiple people in this chapter the most surprising being mina not necessarily that she put him in his place but the way that she did it I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's really cool and heartwarming to see these two caring about one another for reasons outside of her relationship to Kurai. I could plainly see that she's doing what she can to make sure that he doesn't wind up making trouble for himself unnecessarily. She knows that despite his high intelligence, he is still a kid several years their junior. And in some cases, he just simply doesn't understand how to interact with those around him. <laughs> it's really sweet to see that they still have that dynamic, mm. even in spite of everything that has happened lately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to keep their I wanted to keep their relationship as a constant because mm -hmm. like that, that 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 was a that was an unexpected fringe benefit of designing Akuduri mm -hmm. was that like her her and Akuduri get along like in their own way like they, they like you said like they very clearly care about one another oh yeah and I I I, I, I yeah I, I love supplemental supplemental interactions like that because um, mm -hmm. you know if you're if your entire world is encompassed by your significant other and you're not expanding beyond that, yeah, it's a very lonely existence. Oh, absolutely. Nobody likes the couple who isolates themselves and has no friendships once they're together. Yep. <laughs> As Will would say, you love to see it. <laughs> all right. Let's see. The existential crisis brought on by a new level of understanding of what One for All does to people was very interesting to behold, especially given how the only other person we've seen reject it, Togata, didn't understand the full significance of what was being offered. Akuduri thought that he understood it too, and while he wasn't entirely wrong, it's clear that even he can't keep track of every minute facet in a given situation. Him reflecting on how he wishes that he could think the way that Kurt Eye does sometimes was also cool, as I suppose I've never imagined him wanting to think any other way than how his quirk enables him. I mean, like, think about how it's gotta be, though, to, like, be that smart 
and to know that you're so different from everybody else like that that can't be easy it's isolating it is isol yeah it is isolating like i think like the big bang theory does it in a much more humorous way um like, like kind of like makes light of it but like sh uh, there, there's a couple of episodes where sheldon like he he does stuff by himself and he doesn't want anybody seeing what he's doing and so like his mm. friends put in like cameras in his private room to see what he's <laughs> up to and he hacks the feed and he he tricks them into thinking that he's opened a portal into another universe that's hilarious. for like a hot minute and then he like throws the alien parasite down on them and they freak out and he's he's like he, he he's like it's exa he's like he says i have a very hard time understanding social cues social cues and just being around people in general it's exhausting so what do i do i shut myself away for 20 minutes a day and do what i need to do do in order to calm down yeah so like i think that I, like my, my my view into Akuru is that he hasn't realized that he needs that kind of self care mm -hmm. yet, because like he's he's kind of like again he's like thirteen yeah or he's about to turn thirteen, and he's like you know he he's very full, he's very full of himself. Hmm. Um, would you say that Akuru is what you would call neurodivergent? Neurodivergent. So it's it's a term for um, that it kind of encompasses people whose brains function in an alternate way to other people often has a um, diagnosis with it whether it's on this being on the spectrum or having bi bipolar disorder or having ADD or like it's it's something where your brain functions differently from the general I would say population. that's a byproduct of his yeah. quirk then yes yeah yeah and so it's like I think that's that's something that's kind of relatable especially since like the term he's I, not on the yeah. spectrum I would no say. he's not on the spectrum but just because I mean, I'm not on the spectrum, but I am neurodivergent technically mm -hmm. because I have ADD. Well, then I would be as well yeah. with the metacognition. Exactly. Well, and, and with the bipolar disorder. Yeah. And so I think like when your brain, you know, functions a little differently from the general populace, I'm probably butchering the definition of it. So my bad. <laughs> we can actually look up an, a, an actual definition of what um, neurodivergent means. But I think that, you know, you have to, I mean, everyone is unique in their own way and everyone has to come up with ways of functioning normally. But I think when your brain does not function the same way as everybody around you, you yeah. have to get creative with how you fit in and how yeah. you survive and how you cope. I've Otherwise you lose there. it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> definitely been there. Um, yeah. Yeah, he. Um, I think it, it. That's just that isolating yeah, feeling. Yeah, so like, so like to the bit with him, like thinking, like reflecting on how Kurt I thinks is like him. It, it's like he he. Yeah, he he understands that Kurt I sees things differently than he does. Uh, you know, Kurt, like maybe that's because like you, you would think like so Akuru is like he's able to keep track of a lot of things in his head. But that doesn't mean that he has an abject view on everything. And I wouldn't say that Kurai has an abject view either, but he is able to more consistently look at the larger picture of what's going on. Mm. Um, like you can see, like you can see that especially when he's fighting. Like he's, like he's he's always strategi he's strategizing. He's like, all right, how do we optimize? Like how do we optimize this? What it's like how he, he thinks beyond how do I make it out of this? Mm. He's more concerned. He, he's he's more concerned with the big picture. Like okay, how do we protect everybody? How do we make sure that we all get out of this? Okay. Um, and then his own survival kind of comes second, which, you know, we saw where that got him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are, so yeah, th 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 that chapter was fun in the sense that I get to highlight their similarities, but also like make more apparent their differences. Mm -hmm. So I had a good time with that. Cool. Uh, Crow and Tai Yang have arrived and with the former, I look forward to and expect a n quality number of shenanigans. <sighs> also badass hero fights a la Monty Oum style. We'll see, man. <laughs> More than likely. <laughs> Let's see. I'm not sure that I would have had Hatsume and Akira gearing up to work together so quickly, but maybe that's just me. It doesn't seem like we'll be short of their interactions slash mayhem anytime soon, so I imagine we'll be seeing these two geniuses butt heads again, even if they found a way to at least share a workspace. Side note, I bet they make some astounding tech together. Melissa Shield better watch out for the incoming competition. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> Solid point. Ah. So, Akuru is going to assist in the development of the UA barrier along with Nezu. These are more inventions that I cannot wait to see. <laughs> Though I do have to wonder if our sassy boy might figure out who the traitor is ahead of time. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting thought. All right, now for Aries chapter. 
Last time you did chapters covering the same time frame from different points of view, I didn't think too hard about it since the people narrating those installments were all in such different places that it was it felt entirely feasible to do so without any overlap. This though, I'm very impressed at how you managed to repeat the month of January in this story with little to no repeats in the content. If nothing else, I thought that Aries chapter would be a lot shorter, but you managed not to not only to cover entirely new angles at every turn, you kept each aspect of her character exploration more than interesting. Yay, mission accomplished. Truly well done, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I was worried about that. I was like, it was... I was concerned when you told me you were going to tell the same story from different points of view. I was like, oh no, oh no. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do the same the paragraphs post... with like the with okay. like different points, like different thoughts running along it. Like, like basically the way that it works is that you could take these three chapters and like layer them together so that one con where one conversation mm -hmm. ends in one chapter you can just continue it straight on to the mm -hmm. next one mm -hmm. and it would just be a perspective shift mm -hmm. and that's the yeah, that, that's what i was trying to go for and it sounds like i'm succeeding nice. um her taking a minute to talk with mina about the f differences between present and future was interesting as this is the first time the topic has really felt personal let's say as in, up to now, Ari has been explaining events, not really the people who were involved in them, if that makes sense. Her having to get acclimated to the idea that she's now equal peers, if not the one being looked up to, with the people who basically raised her was not something that I would have thought too hard about, but clearly you did, and put it to great effect. Also, holy crap, she's never been to school and she's got Aizawa for the homeroom teacher? Heaven help this poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> Slash dad. Dadzawa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, I guess you're right. Like, I hadn't thought about it in as many terms, but you, I, I guess you're right that, like, up to now, Ari has been, like, explaining, has been explaining events and not so much the people. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess in my head, they were just conflated, but yeah. th that is a distinction that's made here. So yeah. you're, yeah, you're right. Um, good catch. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose, so, but I'll take it. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bakugo getting pissed off by one for all users copying slash outperforming will outperforming him will never not be funny to me enough said <laughs> Ari still looking to deku for approval is giving me cavities it's so sweet throw in her interactions with lamillion and i'm straight up going to need a root canal oh my gosh <laughs> of course togoto would be the one to really help her feel at home and i am here for it that guy is way too good for this world i'm a little yeah. sad that we didn't get to see big Ari starting to teach little Ari, but i get it i'm already losing enough teeth to the sweetness in this chapter we can only handle so much <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that I think was my favorite scene to write in that chapter was was uh, Air, future Air hanging out with Lamillion. Mm. It's like, yeah, she 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 needed that. She needed that. Um, let's see. I know I made a joke about Eraserhead being her homeroom teacher earlier, but she clearly needs her father figure slash dad Zawa to figure a few things out. Life is about more than the mission, kid. It wasn't a super emotion heavy moment or anything, which I really appreciate because I don't really see that being Aizawa's style. This felt really him, if that makes any sense. Not like a lot of fanfics where they make the man way too fatherly to the point where it doesn't even feel like the original character anymore. Mm. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Let's see. Still, even if she's not, even if she's Dadzawa's not kid, her master was clearly Deku, given her foot and mouth syndrome. <laughs> Felt kind of bad for Todoroki when she brought up the topic of Dobby, but I mean, at least their family won't be taken by surprise in the middle of a battle this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's that. Uh, regarding Mina and Aries' interactions, I do have one question. They seem to be pretty good friends by now. Nothing wrong with that. It feels natural to the flow of the story. But I have to wonder which of them approached the other in a casual sense to become proper friends first. Again, this is not a criticism as it doesn't leave a blank space in the flow of the story. It's just a curiosity I have. Um, I'm going to say that Mina approached Aerie first. Um, but Aerie was quick to latch on to her because she... Because you know, we saw in the future, Mina was one of the, like, longest surviving people somehow. Um, which I'm going to attribute to Awkward or, like, doing everything he could to keep her alive. Uh, more than her own desire to do anything. Um, but yeah, so, like, a she would have been one of the ones that Aerie continued to be familiar with as mm -hmm. the years went on. So, to me, it was natural that they would, that they would link up this way. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts no, on that? No, that makes sense to me. Okay. That's solid. Okay. Uh, now, both chapters lead me to asking the same question, that being, what did Kurai do this time? From the preview, we see him we meeting a woman who I assume to be Shoto's mother, but nothing in that excerpt leads me to being able to even guess what's going on with him at the moment. I really hope we get an answer to that in this next chapter, which I am very much looking forward to, as always. 
Be well and happy writing, Mataris. Thanks for another set of awesome, awesome literary art. Oh. Well, there we go. He didn't say literary content. Nice. Thank you, Felicita. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice of you. That's the goal, buddy. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that being said, I mean, that that's a good said, introduction yeah. so, to the chapter. Yeah. Let's go yeah. for it. Let's go. Let's go. Start to fall as it turns to a pour We're here again in this storm that we've been here before I see the street signs warning telling me that I have no other place I could go Feel like I'm stuck in motion, can't find balance, I'm living of a loved one. Mina woke with a shiver as her subconscious finally managed to alert her to the fact that her body temperature had dropped enough to warrant goosebumps and mild discomfort. Looking down at herself, she saw through blurry eyes in the pre-dawn light that one of her legs was somehow on top of her comforter, while the corresponding arm was hanging loosely off the bed entirely. She let out a groan when the clock told her that she still had two hours before she was supposed to wake up before yanking her limbs back under the covers and waiting for her body heat to do its job and warm the rebellious limbs back up. She'd always been a heavy sleeper, and so her unconscious habit of tossing and turning had never bothered her before. Now, though, there was something she was missing desperately. Something that had always brought her comfort and warmth to chase away the nightmares that did manage to wake her on occasion. As she squeezed her eyes shut against the stinging that had become all, an all-too-familiar companion in the mornings, she remembered all the mornings that she had woken up beneath an extra set of blankets that Kurt I would put on her so that she didn't end up getting cold during the night, and the evenings when memories of the awful battles they had been forced to endure kept her from falling asleep until he put his arms around her, lulling her into a realm of more pleasant dreams that lasted until she woke up full of energy and enough cheer to face the day. It had been over a month since she had felt the security and comfort that came with having Kurt I by her side whenever she needed him, and it was starting to take a physical toll on her in ways that she hadn't expected. She obviously didn't sleep well. She had started to lose weight in spite of forcing herself to maintain her regular eating habits, and she hadn't had the, the energy or inclination to practice her break dancing since Nabu Island. She could barely drag herself through the days at school, and it was all she could do to perform her duties at her work study with passable adequacy. Hagakure and Ayama had picked up on her lack of strength and had done what they could to help her while they were out on patrol, but there was only so much they could do without making it seem as though they were doing all the work for her. Mina had truly done her best not to let Kurdai's current situation affect her too badly, but her efforts seemed doomed to failure every time she reflected upon the fact that the boy she loved might not ever make it out of the hospital the way that she remembered him being. She tried to hold out hope for his sanity to be mended, but, as she well knew, Kurdai had a long streak of fairly rotten luck. He promised he would make it back to me, she thought as she shivered under the blankets again. Of course, the darker, doubting part of her mind took that moment to hiss, and what good is a promise from him? He already broke his word to me when it really mattered. Why should I believe him this time? As the ugly thoughts stole into her brain, she felt tears sink into her pillows while she was forced to remember their final moments together on Nabu Island. She could see his broken body, feel the hot blood covering her arms as she held him close, taste the ash in, this, in the air as the smell of burning earth assaulted her nose, all as the winds from Nine Storm howled above their heads. That was the last memory she could recall before she had woken up in a makeshift hospital room with Yairozu waiting by her bedside, tears flowing down her face telling Mina what had happened before the words were even spoken. In some ways, it felt as though that had been the last time she had seen the Kurai she had fallen in love with. Even now, she still loved him, but it was as though he were a hollowed-out version of the boy she had gotten to know over the year. It's not his fault, she fiercely reminded herself, forcing the traitorous thoughts out of her head. I'm not the same person I was when I started at UA, and I haven't suffered even half as much as he has. The part of her mind that craved self-pity now took the time to remind her that because she loved him the way she did, she too had suffered because of his actions. 
He never listened to me when I worried about him, she thought involuntarily. Makes it easy to wonder if he ever really cared at all. Ah! She growled as she threw her covers off herself and sat up so that she could start smacking her head with her pillow. Stop it, stop it, stop it! She screamed internally. He made mistakes just like anyone else can. He was put in impossible situations. He did the best that he could. Stop blaming him for that! Eventually, the silent screams turned into audible ones that she vented into her pillow as she rocked back and forth, praying to Kurdai's ancestors that he would be able to find peace in this world with her before she lost her mind, too. It wasn't until the sun was rising and Izuku found Mina running on the school track that she was reminded that it was Sunday, meaning that there were no classes for them to attend later. Maybe I can catch a few winks before I go out on patrol tonight, she thought as her friend asked to join her on a jog around the campus, which she agreed to. Given her recent marathon of nightmares and bouts of anxiety, she chalked the thought up to wishful thinking, but it wasn't going to stop her from trying once she'd had breakfast and a shower. Is this what Kurt I felt like after I Island in the summer camp? She well remembered how the bags under his eyes had formed in the week following those horrid events, as well as the pallor of his skin as his strength of mind began to fail him. She knew that if she bothered to take a solid look in the mirror right now, the similarities in their appearances would be startling, and given how different they looked, any parallels between their visages would be disconcerting in the extreme. Trying to ignore the melancholic thoughts that were plaguing them, the two students jogged in relative silence for some time before Izuku decided to try and break it. I didn't know you ran, he said as they rounded a corner where a wooden bench had a few icicles hanging off of its back. I used to do it a lot more often before I started dating Kurtai. She panted a little more out of breath than her friend, having been running for nearly an hour already. He hates cardio, though, so when I go jogging, I still have to do it by myself, which is no fun. Well, if you ever need a partner to train with, I usually go running every other morning, Izuku offered. It might make for a nice change of pace having someone else to run with. I might take you up on that, Mina replied a little sluggishly. I'm not usually up this early, though. Kurt, I did say you were a late sleeper, Izuku said with a slightly nostalgic smile. When all he got from his running partner was silence, he wiped the grin away and apologized by saying, Sorry, that wasn't sensitive. You're fine, she told him. He's right. I do like to sleep a lot. Having bad dreams doesn't help that to happen, though. Izuku winced before he told her, I'm sorry, Ashido. Have you talked to Recovery Girl? I know Kurdar was able to sleep a lot better after she pre prescribed him some medicine. I haven't had time, Mina gasped as they started up a small incline. Between school, homework, and work studies, we barely have time to eat, much less any free time. If Kurdar was here and acting like this, wouldn't you tell him to make time? Izuku asked bluntly, causing his friend to slow her jog until they both came to a stop, their breaths fogging up the air between them as they faced each other. Eventually, Mina dropped her gaze away from his and nodded slowly. Yeah, she mumbled. I would. I have. I'm sure that when he comes back, he wouldn't want to see you in a similar state to the one he was in when everything with the League of Villains really got started, Izuku added, keeping his tone gentle. Ochako keeps telling me the best way I can help her be a hero is to take care of myself, and I think the same applies here. Kurai may not be a hero anymore, but if he's going to succeed in life, he'll need you to take care of yourself, too. I know, Mina said as her fists clenched and her arms shook. But why does that feel like it doesn't apply to him? What do you- If I'm supposed to take care of myself for his sake, why didn't he ever take care of himself for mine? Mina burst out, unable to contain the thoughts any longer. Tears poured out of her eyes as she glared at Izuku, who backed up a pace as she started to shout, I did everything that I could to support him, to believe in him when he said he would never fight unless he believed he could make it back to me. But when we all told him, when I told him, that he needed to stay out of the fight, he just wouldn't listen! She nearly collapsed from exhaustion right there, but Izuku managed to keep her from falling by catching her up, which let her pound weakly on his chest in frustration. It's not fair, she sobbed. If I can't keep him safe from himself... Who's supposed to do it? What did I do wrong? What should I have done differently? I just want him to be okay. Izuku was at a loss for what to do in this situation. He was used to being the one unable to control his tears while someone else told him to get his act together or just waited for the crying to stop. He doubted that either of those things were going to, try, going to help in this situation, so he racked his brain to try and find a solution for the mess he now found himself in. Eventually, he decided to go with honesty. Ashido... I don't know what I'm supposed to tell you, he said slowly as he put his hands on her shoulders. 
I've been asking myself the same questions whenever I get the chance, but I haven't been able to come up with anything. Mina pulled back to see that Izuku was giving her a pained smile as tears began to gather at the corner of his eyes in a manner similar to hers. I don't know what else we could have done to keep him safe. Maybe I could have given one for all to you, or Chaka, or even Kachan if I had just tried to reach you. Maybe that would have let us save him, but I don't know that for certain. And besides, I told him that when I gave him the quirk, he was the only one I wanted to give it to, because he was the first to realize that it was time for a change in the way the quirk was used. That it was time for the bearer to fight alongside others instead of trying to shoulder the burden alone. But he ended up doing that anyway. She sniffled as she dashed at her eyes, now feeling embarrassed by her outburst. He fought until he couldn't fight. And then he kept going, just like All Might did. No, not exactly, Izuku replied, doing his best to hold eye contact with the girl. He wasn't trying to take on his own burdens all alone. He took on the ones that I inherited in addition to his own so that I wouldn't be alone. Just like how you did everything you could to take on his burden so that he wouldn't be alone. Standing on his own didn't get him killed. His voice caught before he forced himself to swallow the lump in his throat and say, The truth is, I killed him. Because I couldn't stand on my own against Nine. And I asked him to stand with me even knowing he couldn't possibly survive it if he did. Ashido, oh, I am so sorry. The dam broke and Izuku started to bawl his eyes out as he continued to hang on Mina's shoulders like a lifeline while his arms shook heavily with the weight of burdens unseen. I killed Kurai, he repeated in a broken voice. I killed the guy who reached out and helped me to master one for all. The guy you loved. The first person who treated me like family other than my mom. I killed him. Heaving in a deep lungful of cold air, Izuku just managed to gasp out. I'm sorry, I haven't said anything before now, but I'm so sorry, Ashido. After I got him killed, his last act was to make sure that I could still become a hero. And all I've done is resent him ever since. Please, you ever forgive me for what I did to him and you. Mina did her best to support the crying boy from the awkward angle of his grasp on her shoulders while she tried to process what he was saying and what he had asked of her. As she struggled to come up with a reply, an image of Kurai's wry grin and a phrase he had used several times when he had people apologizing to him popped into her head. Doing her best to take in a shaky breath, she told the boy, There's... There's nothing to forgive, Izuku. When the boy continued to cry, she reached up and placed her own hands on his quaking shoulders in a manner similar to how he had done with her while she said, You're right. Maybe things could have gone differently if one for all had gone to somebody else. But we'll never know, and what could have been doesn't really matter. We can only act on what we have now, which is what he did in the end. I know that, and you know that, even if it doesn't make it hurt any less. Then, <laughs> what do we do now? As you could gasp out through the spasms shaking his body. What do we do different so that this, this never happens again? Kurai has already removed himself from the equation of heroics. Mina sighed as she felt more tears slide down her face. Maybe that's why I feel so lost. I want him safe, but I don't know how to keep moving forward as a hero without being able to chase after him. I know what you mean, Izuku admitted weakly. All Might was my role model, but after years of chasing after Kachan, Kurai was be was became the hero who was actually in my life. I want to be a hero who stands tall with a smile on my face whenever people need me. But now the hero who always stood his ground can't and it makes me wonder if there's something out there that could break me like he's broken now his body gave vent to another violent shudder before he mumbled i don't want to put anyone else around me through that the two of them were quiet save for their sniffles as they tried in vain to stifle their tears while they held on to one another amid the falling snow of early winter eventually mina released her friend and dashed at her eyes while she said we're not going to do ourselves any favors by just standing out here I know I said I'd do a lap around campus, but I think I'd better head back to my room. Yeah, Izuku replied as he straightened himself up and wiped at his own face. I understand. I think I'll finish my run and then head back, though. For sure. Mina nodded in a subdued manner. Before her friend could leave, though, she did say, Thanks, Izuku. For what? For listening, she told him. And for saying everything that you did. 
it helps knowing that I'm not the only one wrestling with all this, even though things are technically getting better. I guess Misery really does love company, Izuku said with a hint of black humor. He was also quick to add, Thank you for listening to me too. I'm sorry I laid more on top of what you were already dealing with. No, it's good for me to know where you're at with all this, seeing as you've got Kurt Eye's old power, she reminded him. But now that I think about it, there's at least one thing you could do to help yourself out with all of this. There is? He asked with a hint of eagerness. Yeah, Mina said with a sad smile. Next time you're feeling this twisted up inside, don't just keep it bottled up. Talk to Ochako. She'll be there for you, and it'll be better for the both of you to confide in each other. Plus, she knows you better than I do, so maybe she'll have some actual ideas of what you should do right now. And don't get started with the I don't want to bother her crap. That's the kind of stuff that got Kurai ripping pieces off his arm when we first moved into the dorms, remember? Izuku flinched at the memory of that night, and seeing that her point had gone home, Mina nodded and started to walk slowly back toward the direction of the freshman living quarters. See you later, Izuku. Later, Ashi. You know my name, boy. Later, Mina? Better. Two days later... Mina was still feeling pretty crummy, but after a private talk with Ochako, Izuku seemed to get regain some of his old drive and determination fueling his actions again. Following up on Aerie's first display against the robots, he took up his turn in order to test his control over Energon. In public, under Endeavor's watch alongside Todoroki and Bakugo, he had made sure to only use the quirk to enhance his physical strength and reflexes, not utilize the energy blasts that he could produce. As he had yet to come up with a convincing excuse for the sudden change to his power set. He wasn't very good at regulating the amounts of power that he released yet. But thanks to some notes that Kurai had left for him before him being taken to, to Mori, as well as input from Akarui, he was already making swift progress. In order to demonstrate said progress, he destroyed half his targets with a series of punches and kicks, while the other half was brought down by a handful of compact lasers that vaguely resembled Bakugo's AP shot autocannon. It couldn't exactly be called a super move just yet, as the maneuver lacked its own unique spin from Deku, but it was a start in the right direction, especially since he wasn't just aiming and hoping for the best in terms of energy release. Of course, it was also enough to set off his explosive rival on another rant about how his fighting style wasn't up for grabs by losers who couldn't control their own powers, leaving several of the people in his class laughing quietly on the sidelines. Once he had managed to get away from Bakugo, mostly because it was the other boys' turn to have a go at the robots, Izuku made his way over to the girls, whom each congratulated him on his new level of control. You're a little stiff with some of those moves, but you're looking a lot like Kurai did when he first came to UA, Mina complimented him. Well, some of it has to do with the fact that I can only let my emotions into my actions so much before I start to lose control, so I'm kind of walking a tightrope every time I use the quirk, he admitted with a nervous laugh. I'm glad that my bones aren't at risk for breaking anymore, but I can't wait to use that device Akaduri made for me when the time comes. When the time comes? Ari asked him with a slightly tilted head. Why haven't you used it already? Wouldn't it be easier to control Energon if you use the device now? Yeah, but the device that Aki made for him won't work unless Izuku completely drains his body of the energy reserves while he's wearing it, Mina explained to the other, work, other, other girl. That's more power than in a country's worth of weapons. It's not just something he can fire up with the safety on. He'd have to go all out for real. Wait, when Kurdai fought alongside Deku and All Might, he wasn't releasing anywhere near as much power as when he fought the Nomu in Fukuoka, or when he fought on Nabu, Ochako pointed out. Did he really use up all of his strength on on I Island? There's a few factors that explain that, Izuku replied as explosions began to tear at the battle droids in the background. The first is that by the time Kurai even put on the device, he was already pretty tired, having fought his way past 200 floors worth of guards as well as a few villains. Second is that his body wasn't as strong as it was when we fought together against Nine, so he had less energy to vent to begin with. The third factor is just a theory on Akaduri's part, but he thinks that even though his chakra centers had no bearing on the way that his power was released before he altered his neurology, corrupted chakra may have still impeded the energy flow from the beginning. Remember, every time he unlocked a new chakra, he'd get stronger in general. Not the first few times, Mina replied with a slight frown as she recalled events during their second semester. He stayed pretty consistent right up until he found out about his dad, which is when he kind of hit a wall in terms of physical progress. Really? Ochako asked as her eyes drifted upward in thought. I actually thought he slowed down after that. Once we managed to rescue Eri, he got back up to full steam. At least, what we thought was full steam for him. And after his fight in Fukuoka, he started getting even more powerful than before, Izuku reminded them. At first, I had just attributed his lack of strength as a side effect of his depressive state at the time, but looking back on it, there may have been more to it than that. 
you think that some of his chakra centers that had been clo- open clo- got clogged up because of the news about his father and the way that people were treating him at school? I mean, a guess to which the boy nodded quickly. That makes sense, looking back on it. Akuturi once told me that a chakra, even if a chakra point is cleansed, it doesn't mean it'll stay that way for good, Izuku told them. With the way that I've been able to utilize the quirk so far, when I measure it against how much power could I was able to utilize, I'd like to think that I have three, maybe four clean chakra points. I won't know for sure until I have a chance to make use of the alteration device, but it's good to know that I don't have to completely start figuring this thing out from scratch. About figuring things out, I might have a way to help you develop your fighting style a little more. Eri said as she idly scratched a spot behind her horn. You do? Ochako asked, looking as surprised as Mina did in that moment. But you have Deku's old quirk. Shouldn't the teaching thing be the other way around? I'm already receiving help from him and All Might, Eri replied with a little smile. I may not have ever received energy on, but I saw Deku in action with it plenty of times in the future. I couldn't give him all the technical details for what he did with the quirk, but if I outlined some of the ultimate moves they used, it might help him develop his own fighting style a little faster than if he did it on his own. Hey, Deku! Bakugo shouted as he started walking toward their group, his hands sizzling as he left a pile of demolished robots in his wake. How are them apples, huh? I smoked your pathetic time for this exercise! This is amazing! Izuku said excitedly as his eyes shone at Eri. I've always done my best to learn from people who came before me, which is only natural if you think about it. But if we could pull this off, that means I'll actually be learning from someone who hasn't even come around yet. The pro version of me! Don't ignore me, Deku! That Wednesday, the majority of the students were in from their work studies, so they took the time to share in the task of making dinner with each other. They were pleasantly surprised when Akaduri also showed up, having been able to take a break out of his busy schedule to join them for a bit. At first, it seemed as though it was going to be a good end to what had been a long day of hard work, but of course, Class A's rotten luck had yet to run out. In spite of the efforts to look at Akaduri as someone with his own accomplishments and contributions to their cause to make, it was impossible for everyone to look at him without seeing his brother. Until recently, many of them had never even met him before he was in the wheelchair, which had done nothing good for his physical constitution, but it certainly made him look different from Kurai. Now, though, even in spite of the fact that he had a different sounding voice, different eyes, and a different hair color than his brother, he still resembled him very strongly, especially if one remembered how Kurai looked before the events of the summer camp. Even his mannerisms and intonations tended to match that of his elder siblings. Obviously, emotions were still running high, and even though it had been days since Kurai's departure, partway into their conversation about whether or not Todoroki would become the next wielder of one for all, Akuru excused himself and fairly ran out of the building. Mina hesitated after standing up in her chair, unsure if she should go after him or not, and then found herself looking at her friends for guidance. Unfortunately, they looked just as lost on what to do as she felt, so she stayed like a deer frozen in the headlights until there was a knock at the door that Akuru had just run out of. The entire gathering of students stood up from their seats as four people whom they had never seen before came walking in, all of them wearing their school's uniform. Two were boys, one with blonde scraggly hair and the other with a long black ponytail. The other pair were girls, one of whom had an excitable look about her and the other being a stunning beauty with strong red hair. Hello, said the last girl with a friendly wave. Is this class 1A? Pira! Ruby exclaimed excitedly as she bolted toward the new students. To the collective surprise of many of their classmates, Pierre was actually able to hold her ground against a tackle hug from the energetic younger girl. Nora, what's shaking? Yang said as she delivered a bone-jarring fist bump to the shorter girl with orange hair, who met the blow with a savage grin that many of the others in the room found to be a little unsettling. Ren, you're looking well. Why said as she greeted the young man with black hair, while studiously ignoring the smile and wave from his blonde companion. It's good to see you, Weiss, he had answered as he inclined his head in a way of polite greeting. I must admit, Second Amendment hasn't felt the same without Team Ruby among its numbers. You mean it's less chaotic. My original statement still stands. John! Ruby squealed as she threw herself from Pira to the blonde boy, who, unlike his companion, was not ready for the enthusiastic greeting and quickly found himself lying on the floor with his eyes slightly crossed from the impact. Ruby, you're going to kill me one of these days, he groaned. Good to see you, Pira. Blake said while moving toward the beautiful redhead. We were bummed when you guys didn't make it in time for the semester to begin. Yes, well, some of the paperwork took a little longer to go through than Professor Osmond thought it would. Pierre replied with an apologetic smile. I'm simply glad to see all of you again, regardless of the timing. Uh, anyone want to do introductions? Jiro asked before the eight students could keep talking. Oh, right. Yang grinned as she turned to face the others. Sorry about that, guys. 
Team Juniper meet Class 1A, the awesomest gang in this whole school. Class A meet Johnny Boy Arc, Lyran, Nora Valkyrie, and Piranikos. They're the second coolest team at our old school. Nuh-uh, Nora protested before anyone else could begin to make individual introductions. We've got the queen of the castle on our team. We're the coolest. We've got the youngest student any team captain to make it into Second Amendment. Our team's better, Yang shot back. We've got the better cook. You've got Jean. Hey, you've got the ice queen. Hey, have you nothing to say in your leader's defense? Jean protested from where he was being pulled up by a giggling Ruby. Yeah, Yang grinned at Nora, who was now giving her a stink eye. Got anything to say on behalf of your fearless leader? In response, the smaller girl's face split into an unnerving smile before she said, I don't need to. We have Pure Nikos on our team. Yang started to protest, then visibly deflated. Damn it, she's got us there, she grumbled. Fine, you win this one. Welcome to UA, guys. Looks like things are about to liven up even more around here. Ochako grinned as she and the others moved toward the newcomers. All things considered, that doesn't sound so bad. Izuku chuckled as he went to follow her. Everyone quickly made their rounds of introductions while the Americans did their best to memorize the names and faces of their new schoolmates. It helped that Yang had a habit of taking pictures and emailing them to her friends back home as a way of letting them know how they were doing, so they were at least somewhat familiar with the appearances of most of them. About midway through the introductions, after Ari had joined them and introduced herself, yet another set of newcomers arrived. Although they had never met them before, it was easy for the freshmen to tell who they were on sight. Hey girls, said a muscular blonde man as he walked in and held his arms out wide. Where's my hug? Dad! Somewhat to the surprise of everyone in the room, neither Ruby nor Yang held any reservations about crashing into their father for a group hug in front of all their friends, Team Juniper practically being shoved aside in the process. That's kind of embarrassing, Mina commented in an aside to Ochako, and that's coming from me. I think it's sweet, the gravity girl replied as she looked on with a smile. Any further words were disrupted when there was a short burst of rose petals from Ruby that ended with her hanging off the arm of a scruffy-looking man who smelled like he had just come out of a dive bar. Uncle Crow! She squealed, looking more excited than the others had ever seen her. Did you miss me? Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? Crow eyed his niece with a quirked eyebrow before he grinned at her and said, Nope. Yay! Hey, I missed you! Taiyang complained as Yang disengaged from the hug. Don't I count? How'd you guys get here so fast? His elder daughter asked as she looked between the two of them. I thought you said your flight didn't get in until tomorrow. How do you think we got here? Her father answered, his irritation at his brother-in-law already forgotten. We used our legs! Ow! Kaminari grunted as several of the others each cringed at the obvious attempt at a joke. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank all the sidewalks for keeping me off the streets. Tai Yang went on, causing even more of the students to cringe. Well, now we see where Yang gets her stupid sense of humor. Mina muttered as their classmate tried in vain to contain her laughter, while Ruby and Crow looked on with something like exasperated disdain. Hey, I'm on a roll! Tai Yang quipped as he reached for a nearby plate and plucked a bread piece off of it with a goofy smile on his face, leading his other daughter and his comrade to look at him with downright disappointment. Dad, it might have been butter if you never started. Yang snickered, causing everyone around them to cringe even harder. Ugh, was that joke made of paper? Her father snorted, barely containing his laughter. This effort turned out to be fruitless after him and Yang both shouted out, Because it was terrible! As they dissolved into a mass of loud laughter, everyone else turned toward Crow, who was already reaching for his hip flask. And people wonder why I carry this thing around, he muttered. Sir, consuming alcohol on campus is strictly prohibited, Ida tried to protest. Crow shrugged at him before saying, I don't care. Then he downed the drink while the class rep looked on with an open jaw and a look that showed just how lost he was with how to proceed with this situation. Crow, you're a bad influence, Taiyang shouted at the other man, his smile gone. Would it kill you not to bring your drinking problem to just one place? Just one. It's only a problem when I run out. Mina turned toward Weiss, who was rubbing the bridge of her nose with her eyes shut tight. Is it always like this with them around? She asked the pale girl. Honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to apply for the exchange program to this school was to get away from their family squabbles. Weiss groaned. You guys have Smash Bros? Crow asked as he walked toward the TV with Ruby still hanging off his arm. I'll drop the flask for tomorrow if one of you pipsqueaks can beat me. Kaminari! Midoriya! Bakugo! Ida cried as he turned toward the three other three boys, who all flinched at the desperation on his face. You must defeat him! Put all the hours of mind-numbing, time-wasting nonsense you've ever accumulated into use in defeating this miscreant! Wait, why me? Izuku yelped as he was handed a controller and made to sit in front of the TV while the others snatched up their own devices, even as Ruby and Yang followed suit. Because you seem to have a rather obscene level of luck when playing this game! 
Edith told him as he powered the Nintendo up and waited for the loading screen. We need all the advantages we can get to defeat this madman! Don't go putting Deku's stupid luck on the same level as my skills! Bakugo demanded. I don't think I've ever seen Edith so fired up about a game before, Mina said to Aerie, unable to keep a little smile from working its way onto her face. Of course, it soon died away when she mumbled, Here's something to tell Kurt Eye about next visit. Aerie looked at her with sympathy before she asked, Any idea when that'll be? Probably not for a couple of weeks, she mumbled. Classes and homework are kicking my butt. And then there's work studies, so that amount of free time isn't really a thing for me right now. We were able to exchange letters, and I'm supposed to get a 15-minute phone call with him tomorrow, at least, so there's that. Why not tell him about it tomorrow, then? Ari asked her. It's, it's not the same if I can't show him the faces he was making, Mina said with a forced smile. Some things are just better done in person. Somehow, Mina managed to drag herself through the next day and finish up her assignments before it was time for Kodai's call to come in. She probably didn't do a very good job on a fair amount of it, but at this point, she really didn't care. She had gotten by with less effort earlier in the year, and as long as she was earning passing grades, she felt that she had fulfilled her obligations as a student as well as could be expected under the circumstances. Of course, as fate would have it, the one time she worked to finish her assignments early was the best set of circumstances where she should have taken her time. Kurai had mentioned that he would be allowed to call sometime between 6 and 8 in the evening, so she had made sure to get her work done by the earliest possible moment. Unfortunately... She wound up pacing back and forth in her room, waiting for the phone to ring for more than an hour as several bad scenarios danced around in her head, each one worse than the last. By the time the phone did ring, Mina was sweating lightly, and her legs were sore from all the nonstop walking in circles. Recognizing the hospital's phone number on her screen, she drew in a breath and answered the call with a shaky, Hello? Hey, came the reply. Kurai's tone sounded a lot lighter than she had expected it to. Sorry it took me so long to call. The guy before me was having trouble deciding which personality was going to talk to his mother. Well, make sure you give each of those personalities a talking to for me after this. Mina said, her voice still trembling as a little smile worked its way across her face as she finally sat down on her bed, her legs practically groaning in relief. She ignored the tears sliding down her face as she added, It's so good to hear your voice. Yours too, he replied, sounding like he was smiling. Feels like I've been waiting for a lot longer than two weeks for this to happen. I know what you mean, she laughed in a choked voice. How have you been? Making progress with your counseling? Yeah, actually, he admitted, which surprised her. Given how sullen and resentful he had been when he had been admitted, she had expected it to be some time before he would willingly open up to anyone. As if he could sense her intrigue, he went on to explain... Dr. Kentaro referred me to this lady who kind of had a similar childhood to me. Her parents were killed in the villain attack while she wound up losing a few pieces of her body during the same incident. Obviously, it's not the same thing as what happened to me, but it does help to know that she can at least empathize with my circumstances. Mina breathed out an audible sigh of relief before she said, I'm so glad to hear that, could I? Seriously, I can't even tell you how good it is to hear this from you. Well, it hasn't all been a cakewalk in good progress. He admitted, causing her to sit up a little straighter than before. I kind of did something stupid on New Year's Eve. She blinked a couple of times before she asked, What did you do exactly? I may have gotten myself kicked out of a group session after waking up on the wrong side of the bed, he told her. I've been behaving since then. Could I? Why would you? She paused before she could really get started, something he had said finally clicking into place for her. Did you say this happened on New Year's? Yeah. He said in a small voice. She closed her eyes before murmuring, It was your birthday. Yeah. Mina swallowed past the lump in her throat before she managed to say, I'm sorry you had to spend it alone. That must have been hard. Because he was there under a different identity, he had also gone in with a different birth date, meaning that even if the hospital would have been willing to do something nice for him, they would have not known to do so on the correct day. Well, I can't exactly blame on anyone other than myself for the way it turned out, he replied in a resigned tone. I'm responsible for being in here. Before she could say anything to the contrary, he decided to press on and say, Sorry, I shouldn't be using this time to complain. We can do a makeup celebration when I get out of here. How are you holding up? Did you get in with the work study that you wanted? Oh, uh, yeah. Mina stumbled over her response a little, not having expected the sudden change in topic, though she supposed it made sense, seeing as Kodai probably didn't want to start getting too emotional in a room where any number of people could see him. I got in with Yoro Musha, the number nine hero. 
Aoyama and Hagakure are doing it with me. Hey, that's awesome. Kurai responded, sounding like he was smiling again. I'm proud of you. Thanks, but it hasn't been easy. She admitted, allowing some of her exhaustion to leak into her tone. I know it'd be hard under the best of circumstances, but with everything that's been going on, I feel like I'm just barely keeping my head above water. I... Damn it, Kurai, I really miss you. I miss you too. He replied, also sounding tired. I promise I'm doing my best to get out of here and to do it the right way. I want to make it back to you so that you won't have to worry about where my head is when I get out. I know. Nina sniffed as she wiped at her eyes, which were already feeling raw. It's really hard to wait like this, but thanks to Ari, I can wait on you this time around, so... Silver lining? I would say so, Kurt I said, which surprised her again. Before she could comment on it, he added, I might miss my ancestral home, but I miss you more. Mina's jaw dropped before she managed to get out. You, you're just saying that. No. His response came in the familiar tone of strength that she remembered him carrying in his bearing, and it was enough to stall any further protests on her part for the moment. Even though most of my memories of that time are gone, I remember often looking forward to the day when you would join me. If that place had any one flaw, it is that you were not there with me. Mina's body shook as new tears began to pour down her face. However, this rain of salt did not hurt her eyes like all the ones that had preceded it in the last few weeks. Neither she nor Kurai could have known it, but he had just struck upon what had been eating away at her ever since he had been resurrected. The thought that he would rather be dead than be in her life again. He had certainly made his anger and resentment known at the fact that he had been brought back against his will. But now he had plainly declared that he had spent the better part of an eternity waiting to be at her side again. When now he furthered the declaration by saying, I'm not getting out of here for my sake, sweetheart. I'm going to get out of here so that I can give you the man that you deserve to have. In spite of herself, Mina felt the corner of her mouth turn upwards, while her cheeks warmed with a heat that rapidly spread throughout her whole body, chasing away the chill that had settled into her bones over the last few weeks. You're really trying to get back on my good side, aren't you? She asked with the faintest hint of a giggle lurking back in the back of her throat. <laughs> Maybe. He chuckled softly, which drew her lips further upward. His tone then grew serious as he said, I know it's probably hard to have faith in me since I broke the last promise I made to you, but I am going to keep this one. I'll spend every day that I'm in here working to make sure that it happens. Mina's face almost fell, but she forced herself to keep the smile in her voice as she said, Well... If I remember correctly, you promised you wouldn't die until all your hair turned gray. Technically, you kept your word on that end. Huh. He said dumbly, which nearly got her to laugh for some absurd reason. I guess I did. Speaking of which, when everything blows over and I'm able to go out in public again, do you think I should switch back or keep it as is? Assuming you're talking about when the war with the Liberation Front is over? I don't know. She admitted, marveling at the fact that just a few smiles were enough to make her feel so much better than she had been for weeks. I haven't been around you new do enough to have a solid opinion on it. Guess you'll just have to get out ASAP so I can decide sooner rather than later. Yes, ma'am, Kodai replied. There was a pause on his end, but it wasn't for too long before he said, I've only got five more minutes before I have to go. Already? She asked sadly. It feels like I hardly got any time with you. Well, if I keep doing well, Dr. Kantara should clear me to have a phone soon, so I'll be able to call you any time that I'm not in a group activity. He assured her, which made her heart feel a little lighter again. For real? Well, they haven't made any progress in the way of a diagnosis, but my moods have mostly stabilized, and I'm being as cooperative as I can other than that one incident, he informed her. They're already letting me borrow books from the hospital library, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but there's a girl who's been in here for almost a year, and she's not allowed to read anything in her room. Granted, that's probably because she has a habit of eating paper, but my point stands. I'm glad that you're making the progress that you are, Mina told him. I really hope they let you have your phone soon. I'll make it happen, he promised her. Uh, oh, real quick, before I have to go, how's Ari doing? She's settling into life pretty well, Mina assured him. I think she's still pinching herself that she's here with us, but the girl kicks ass in class. Really? Dude, she ripped through like a hundred of us to get to you the day that she brought you back, she reminded him. She's got skills. <laughs> Good for her, he said with what sounded like a smile. I, yeah, okay, I get it. Kodai let an exasperated sigh before he said, I'm being told my time is up. Tell Izuku that once I get my phone back, I want to talk to him about a few tips concerning Inaika. Inaika, Mina remembered, was the original name for Energon. Will do, she said quickly. I love you so much, Kodai. I love you too, he replied. 
Tell everyone I said hi. And remember, I'm on my way out to you. Got it? Got it, she said with a smile. See you soon. Real soon. With that, the line was disconnected, and she allowed her phone to drop to the bed beside her. She could feel the chill that had permeated her existence trying to creep back into her marrow. But she shook her head and moved to exit her room, a plan in mind to keep the warmth that Kurai had given her for as long as possible. With brisk steps, she crossed the hallway to the boy's side of the dorms and headed right for her boyfriend's room. She went inside, hardly noticing the cold that came from the day heater's days of in inactivity, and opened up Kurai's closet. Since the day she had told Kurai they were going to be spending less time in close proximity to one another, she hadn't been able to set foot inside, but now she found that her feet carried her quite easily. Having become thoroughly familiar with the contents adorning the hangers, she swiftly found the clothing article that she was looking for and pulled it out. After shaking the piece a few times to get the wrinkles out, she pulled the hoodie over her head and smiled as she felt the soft fabric slide over her arms until the article hung loosely off her body. It was with a light giggle that she thought, I see why he never lets me borrow this thing. It's so comfy. Looking down at herself, she nearly laughed out loud as she reflected on the fact that just a year ago, she'd have dropped dead before touching a clothing item that resembled Vegeta's armor. But here she was. Even though the sweater had been sitting in a cold room for quite some time, Mina was already feeling traces of the familiar warmth that she had so dearly missed. Could I wait an eternity before he got to see me again? She thought as she walked out of the room, a smile still on her face. I can wait a few weeks or months. Hell, even if we have to make it a few years, I'll still wait for him. She hadn't been able to say it out loud, but the fact was that Mina had been afraid that Kurai's efforts to make it out of the hospital would be short-lived, and that he would once again sink into despair at his situation, leaving him as a defeated husk to rot in a psych ward for the rest of his life. It was hard to believe, but with that one phone call and a solid heart-to-heart, -heart, she could smile and face the future again. The next couple of weeks fairly flew by for the pink girl and her classmates. True to his word, Kurai was able to get his phone privileges restored, allowing for more consistent communication between the two of them, as well as some of his other friends. This allowed him to give Izuku more tips on how to regulate the energy flow of his old quirk, especially when it came to conjuring lasers for attack and defensive purposes. While it wasn't exactly easy, them still having to be apart, knowing that she could be there for Kurai when she needed to be, and he for her, certainly made the day more bearable. School remained difficult, and the work study harder still, but now Mina didn't feel like she was drowning in a sea of her own inadequacy. It also wasn't exactly great to know that even after nearly a month of him being in the hospital, the doctors had yet to diagnose the source of his mental deterioration. There were no physical signs of schizophrenia, dissociative identity disorder, or psychosis. Even extreme bipolar disorder was ruled out through behavioral and blood examinations. Even so, neither of the young couple were close to giving up hope that he could make it out of the hospital. If nothing else, he was determined to make it out on the merit of exemplary behavior. At UA, the two freshman hero course classes had started hanging out together more re more regularly, thanks in no small part to the pre-existing friendships between Team Juniper and Ruby. Pony from Class B was especially delighted to have more classmates who spoke her native language in her social circle, and the new students were all pretty easy to get along with. Aerie seemed to be quietly intrigued by the group whenever they were around, which Mina assumed that they had been of some influence in the future, though the white-haired girl never said a word on the matter. An unspoken benefit of Jean's team coming to join their classes was that the competition between the two groups of students was reinvigorated, setting them all out at a breakneck pace to compete with each other on the improvement of their skills. Initially, Kendo and some of the other more responsible students in Class B had been wary of Monomo's nastier tendencies that were sure to make a reappearance under such circumstances. However, much to their collective surprise, the normally antagonistic boy had made no such ploy following Kurai's departure. Not one bad word escaped his lips concerning the former guardian hero, which some of them took to mean that he had finally, FINALLY, taken the teacher's warning seriously. While that was certainly plausible, Izuku couldn't help but feel as though they were missing something. They had seen Monoma in action, practically a slave to the narrative that he had constructed in his head about how Kurai was the only interested in furthering his own fame while stepping all over Class B in the process, or worse, that he was somehow responsible for the League targeting their student body. He had persisted in these ideals even after being stripped of his license and threatened with outright expulsion from UA entirely, and now? Suddenly he had nothing at all to say of the boy he held responsible for every iota of their school's misery? Something didn't add up, so the new wielder of Energon resolved to keep an eye on the antagonistic boy until he somehow proved that he had moved on from his obsession. Little did he know that Blake had already run through similar thoughts in private, and had quietly asked Nora to introduce Monoma to her hammer the second that even a hint of his bitter jealousy started to rear its ugly head. 
As a result of this new healthy rivalry between the freshmen, Sadihiro course students continued to excel in their work studies and mostly at their schoolwork. Those who had been struggling to come up with a second ultimate move since the licensing exams were able to overcome their stumbling blocks, thanks in no small part to the experiences that they were gaining under their pro supervisors. Mina was one, of the, was one of the students who already had two moves under her belt, but she had been determined to upgrade one of them to a new level, as well as, as create a new technique entirely. Before the events of Nabu Island, she had been trying to improve her acid veil with Kurai's help, and she finally got the results she wanted when she showcased her new move, Acid Avatar. It was essentially a full-body coating of some of her stronger acids that would protect her from most kinds of attacks and allow her to have a huge advantage whenever she engaged in close-quarters combat. She had been inspired by Kirishima's unbreakable and Kurai's endless resolve, as she recognized the need for a more solid defense whenever she was backed into a corner and had asked her boyfriend for help in getting a feel for how such a maneuver would work for her. After showing it off to her friend, she ran her fingers through her hair, trying to sh shake off the last of the gray substance that had clung to it while giving them all a big smile. Finally, she giggled. Been trying to get that thing to work for months. That's awesome, Mina. Ochako congratulated her. I'll bet that Kurai will be really impressed when he sees how hard you work to master it, Izuku added, which got her to smile a little more brightly. I know, right? She said cheerily. I've also got another move that I want to show him when he gets out, but it still needs some work before it's ready to be critiqued. Is Kai a critical evaluator? Eri asked curiously. Only if I ask him to be, Mina replied before her smile faded as she suppressed a small shudder. I don't ask him to do it very often, though. He's harsh. I know what you mean, Izuku said with a similar look about him, one that Ochako was also wearing. He's pretty nice when we're asking for help with our own stuff, but whenever we've tried to learn his techniques precisely, he gets... intense. That's a nice way of putting it, Ochako mumbled. Eri tilted her head at the three of them before she said, I didn't realize you had all derived your fighting styles from him so much. Not me, girl, Mina giggled. I couldn't take the pressure, and his moves don't really work with my style, so we decided to drop the idea of me learning combat from him. These guys, on the other hand. My first internship with Gunhead had me learning his martial arts, and I wanted to expand on it, Ochako explained. Kurai's been learning hand-to-hand -hand since he was littler than you are in this time, so he can fight pretty well, even without his quirk. I asked him to teach me in our spare time, and since he was already training with Deku a bunch, it made sense. One thing's for sure, Izuku said with a wobbly grin. We learned a lot about what we were doing wrong. Still, it helped us both to improve, so there's that. Eri looked between the three of them a few times before she said, I feel like I want to see one of these training sessions when he comes back. Even if he won't become a hero, I imagine that he wouldn't object to helping you guys outside, helping you guys outside and me if he has the time. Your funeral, kid. Mina chuckled as she moved to resume her practice. Kurai was humming cheerily to himself as he walked out of the hospital's library, a handful of old Naruto manga in hand. Knowing that he had to wait until the group attendant was also ready to leave with the other patients, he sat on a bench just outside the large room and promptly opened the first volume, as to keep himself entertained until it was time to go. As he immersed himself in the narrative of Itachi's last battle, his ears picked up on the sounds of another small group approaching the library. Adult patients from the sound of things. Normally, the adult and adolescent patients didn't interact for any length of time, but it wasn't entirely unusual for them to pass each other in the halls as they went to and from their daily activities in different parts of the building. Because this was the case, Kurai didn't bother to look up from his comic until the group had passed him by, save for a solitary figure who had stopped to stand in front of him. Raising his gaze to look at the person, Kurai was surprised to see a woman with white hair and soft brown eyes who was dressed as a patient of the ward. He could tell that the color of her tresses had nothing to do with her age. She couldn't have been any older than his mother, who was in her late forties. For whatever reason, her face stirred up a sense of familiarity that he couldn't quite place, especially since he was almost positive that he had never interacted with this person before. Can I help you? He decided to ask as he marked his page and shut the book. Are you Madara Kaiba? She asked in a voice that was nearly as soft as her gaze. Depends on who's asking, Kurai answered with a slightly raised eyebrow, the sensation of familiarity growing stronger. The woman smiled slightly before she replied, I'm Shoto's mother. You're... Kurai's eyes widened before the recognition set in, before he got to his feet so that he could bow formally from his waist. Forgive my rudeness, Mrs. Todoroki, he apologized. To answer your question, yes, I am Kaiba. Because she was a relative of his classmate and therefore a connection to his true identity, even if it was a slim one, Shoto had taken it upon himself to visit his mother soon after Kurai was put in the hospital. Apparently she had agreed to keep the secret. 
But since Kurt I hadn't run into her as of yet, he had honestly forgotten that particular detail until now. No, don't be so formal. The woman urged him gently so that he would straighten up and look at her again, even as the rest of her group moved into the reading area. Please, call me Ray. I'm glad that I finally have a chance to meet the friend that my son has told me so much about. He mentioned me? Kurt I inquired. That can't be good. Ray laughed a little before she gestured to the spot next to him and asked, Is that seat taken? No, please have it, he answered as he moved his manga so that she could have an unobstructed area. Sorry, I didn't offer. No, you're being very accommodating to a very nosy mother. Ray replied as she sat down with a smile still on her face. To answer your question, yes. Shoto has written, about, has written me about you. Several times, in fact. He says that you are one of the people who helped him remember the kind of hero he wants to be, and that he's never seen a braver hero, including All Might. <laughs> I didn't take him as one to exaggerate. <laughs> Could I chuckled as he ducked his head a little. Our friend Izuku is the one who really gave him the push he needed to get going. I just helped keep him pointed in the same direction after he'd gotten started. And I'm not that brave. I can't even face the thought of being a hero anymore. Glancing at the woman out of the corner of his eye, he asked, Did he mention that I'm leaving the hero course after I get out of here? Yes, but I don't think that changed his opinion of you. She said while keeping that soft smile on her face. He still thinks that you're a hero worthy of great recognition, even given what you did for everyone on Nabu. They were speaking in lowered tones, but even so, Kurdar was making sure to keep his eyes and ears out for anyone who might be trying to listen in on their conversation. She hadn't called him by his real name, so his cover was more than likely still intact, but he wanted to be sure. I wish he wouldn't. He sighed once he was certain that their conversation was still a private one. I made a promise to stand my ground no matter what came my way and it broke me. People can't rely on me because I can't stand anymore. A hero like that is no good to anyone. I think you're assuming that people can only hold respect for you because of what they think you can continue to accomplish, which isn't always the case. Ray said as her smile faded, faded in favor of a look of motherly concern that reminded Kurai of his own mom. Shoto respects you for what you've already accomplished. The fact that you've lost the ability to continue being a hero doesn't make those fe previous feats any less worthy of recognition. You held your own under circumstances beyond anything that most of our people could ever imagine, even in the superhuman society of ours. It's easy for a lot of people to just brush off villain and hero fights as everyday happenings, but I know it's hardly an easy path to walk, especially when one's childhood is plagued with so much grief. If even half of what Shoto has told me about you is true, I can see why he admires you so much. Kurai chuckled before turning a slightly pained gaze on the woman and saying, I could argue that his childhood was a lot more jacked up than mine. If anything, his resolve is the one that I should be admiring. I think anyone would do well to admire my son, Ray agreed with a sad smile. But again, his accomplishments and determination to do nothing, do nothing to decrease the impact that you've had on him. I'd just like to say thank you for helping Shoto to become the kind of man that he wants to be. Could I look down on his folded hands for a moment before he returned his gaze to the woman and, and said, Miss Ray, I... Suddenly he stopped in mid-sentence, even as a rumble could be felt on the ground. His eyes went wide and he half stood off the bench that they had occupied while fixing his gaze on the window. Before she could ask him what was wrong, he shouted at the top of his lungs, Everyone, get down! Then he tackled Ray to the ground, even as the windows exploded inward, the rumbling sound having turned into a bellow that assaulted the ears and rattled their bones while glass pelted the wall behind them. A few shards landed on them and dealt some cuts, none of which were serious. The real problem came when they noticed the air had become permeated with some kind of green fog, which sent thrills of alarm down their spines as they registered the implications of such a sight. Bioweapon! Kodai shouted as he laid flat on the floor, pulling a shirt to cover his mouth and nose, urging his new friend to do the same as he did. Don't stand up! You'll be inhaling more of it! Keep your faces covered! Ray did as she was told, hoping that whatever this stuff was, it would be treatable, as she was certain that in spite of the precautions he was having them take, they had already breathed in some of the gas. What the hell is this stuff? Kurai muttered, his mind already working as he tried to think of the safest way for them to get out of the broken glass minefield they were essentially trapped in, as well as whatever they could as well as what they could do to deal with the gaseous substance, whatever it was. Before he could form a coherent thought on the subject, he felt the temperature around him drop rapidly, even as a series of screams began to echo throughout the halls of the hospital from all directions. Even more blood-chilling than that was when he noticed the traces of black bioelectricity crackling along his extremities. Oh, crap baskets. 
Mina, Eri, Izuku, All Might, and Nakaru he had assembled on Aizawa's summons in the teacher's lounge. The haggard-looking man looking especially disgruntled today. I'm sure you already know that we've come to discuss Kodai's current condition. He told them without preamble once they were all seated. Given that you all know about one for all more than I do, I figured it prudent to have each of you present, since what we're about to discuss involves the quirk, even if only partially. Is Kurai okay? Mina asked quickly. He's healthy, Akuturi answered her. That's kind of the issue. What's that supposed to mean? The doctors can't find anything wrong with him, mentally or physically. Aizawa informed them, prompting looks of confusion to cross the room. They've done everything that they can possibly can to figure out what caused his hallucinations and paranoia, both with science and psychic evaluations. Nothing turned up anything out of the ordinary. By all accounts, he should be good to come home. So, is he coming home? Mina asked hopefully. It's not that simple, Aizawa said with a shake of his head, leading the girl to look defeated, prompting Eri to put a comforting arm around her. Believe me, I wish I could authorize his return, but we can't ha risk him going out of control with such a powerful quirk again. I need your help to try and figure out how and if One for All is involved in this. They haven't put him on any medications while he's been in there? Izuku asked with a thoughtful frown. That seems strange given how long it's been since he was admitted. If they gave him the wrong kind of medicine, things could go from bad to worse. All Might reminded his young protege. They haven't been able to diagnose him or even find anything wrong with the chemicals and hormones in his blood work. There's no reason to give him medication as far as they're concerned. Wait, wait, wait. Akuturi said as he held up his right hand with his finger pointed upward. You said they hadn't given him any medication. None. Aizawa confirmed, though he quickly frowned. Actually, they have been giving him quirk suppressants, but they've been shown to have zero effects on a person's mental condition. There's always an exception to the rule. Akuturi replied, his eyes going wider as he stood up from his chair. That's it. It's the quirk suppressants. That's what's been keeping him from seeing Kai. Uh, what? Mina asked with a raised eyebrow. It's also why Aria hasn't been able to contact the previous vestiges, the boy said excitedly, looking at everyone in turn as though he had just invented the cure for cancer. It all makes sense. I can't believe I didn't think of this before. Hikari, slow down, Izuku told him. What are you talking about? What does Kurai taking quirk suppressants have to do with hallucinations and Aries' problems with one for all? It's all one for all, Akuturi replied, his grin widening. That's the common denominator. It ties everything together because Ari and Kurai have the same quirk. Uh, yeah, Mina said, still looking at the boy like he was crazy. That's been well established. No, 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 you're, you're still not getting it, Akuturi said excitedly. It's not just two versions of the same power. It is literally the same power. It's separated by a span of 10 years, but it is the same quirk. So whatever happens to Kurai's power will affect Eri too. What are you talking about? Eri asked, a frown on her own coming to her face. I haven't had any trouble using one for all. Not the physical part, no, Akuri conceded. If I'm right, the energy that's housed within your body belongs to you. It isn't shared. But the psychic plane where the previous users and vestiges still exist... The ones that Midoriya was able to detect when he fought you, even though he no longer has the quirk? That isn't exclusive to you. I think it can be felt by anyone who's had, or more importantly, has the power. And if Kurai can't reach the vestiges because he can't use the power at all, Izuku started to say, Akuru's ramblings beginning to make sense to him. Eri hasn't been able to talk to the vestiges for weeks now. It has started when Kurai went to the hospital, Akuru said, as he smiled triumphantly while everyone else looked dumbstruck. They weren't ignoring her. They can't be heard because Kurai's muted the connection. It also explains why he saw himself as Kai. You're going to have to back up and explain that part, Mina said, her head spinning as she tried to process what was being said. How does his hallucination play into this? It's not a hallucination, Akuturi chuckled. It's him. It's Kurai's vestige. The one who waited for 10 years in the dark to have someone who would be worthy to inherit one for all take up the fight against Shigaraki. No wonder he was pissed at Kurai in this era. Kurai is still alive, Mina said as she shook her head. He can't have a vestige if he still holds the quirk, right? But he can, Eri realized, her eyes now growing wider. Because I brought one for all into a time when he's still alive, even though his spirit is the one who passed it on to me. That vestige still exists within the psychic realm, along with the other previous holders. Young Hikari wasn't hallucinating. He was being confronted by his own vestige, All Might summarized. Yahtzee, Akuturi exclaimed. Kai from the future is probably pissed off because Kurai wants to just hand the power off to someone else when he has the chance to avenge everyone that Shigaraki killed in the future. 
That's why One For All beat him up in the hospital. His own vestige used the cork to get the point across. It wouldn't be the first time something like that has happened, Izuku recalled. The first time I saw the vestiges in the Psychic Collective, All For One's brother triggered the quirk, and I wound up breaking my, accident, my window on accident. I thought that I was sleepwalking at the time, but now it makes more sense. This poses a more serious problem than we initially thought, Aizawa mused with a deep scowl. If this really is the case, and Hikari's vestige is hostile enough to enact violence against his own self, he may never be able to pass the quirk on to someone else. There's also the fact that if the previous wielders don't approve of their new host, they can reject them entirely. Young Hikari would need to make peace with his future self if he wanted to be rid of the power, All Might surmised, looking worried by the prospect. But he can't do that unless he has access to his powers, which presents us with our original problem, the possibility of an out-of-control one for all. There's also the scenario in which future Kurai takes full control over his body. Akuturi added, his smile fading in favor of a much grimmer look. When the others looked at him in alarm, he shrugged and said, I think it's possible. The quirk gets stronger with each new wielder, and Kurai was stupid strong to begin with when it came to him. It's shown that it can control its host's actions to some degree, such as when Midoriya broke his window, and when Kurai slugged himself through a wall. If he goes fully hostile inside his head, and his will is weaker than his self from the future, we might end up with Kurai from Ares' time. And given how long he spent waiting to get his chance for revenge, I doubt my future brother is going to be willing to wait before he attacks the Liberation Front guns blazing. There was an ugly silence for a few moments before Aizawa said, Unfortunately, this is all just supposition on our part until we can prove your theory is fact, and doing that could be disastrous. But if we don't do it, Kurai will never be able to move on with his life. Akuturi replied with a somber expression. He'll spend his whole life wondering if he's about to be taken over by his future self, even if he stays on Quirk's suppressants to prevent that from happening. That's no way to live. He's right. We gotta give him a chance to be free, Mina declared. I'm sure that Izuku and Eri can keep him contained if he goes out of control. Right, guys? I am stronger than he is, and I know that Deku can reach the same level of strength that Kai once wielded if he needs the power. Eri nodded. We could handle him. Yeah. Izuku nodded, no signs of hesitation on his face as he looked at his teacher. This is all because I chose him to be the next wielder, Mr. Aizawa. You have to give me a chance to fix this, to save him. I don't have to do anything, their teacher said in a thin voice, instantly killing their verbal momentum. However, he did also add, but I agree, he doesn't deserve to live in constant fear like that. He paused again before letting out a sigh and saying, I'll contact his doctor to get his release from Itamori started. All Might, I'll leave it to you and Nezu to arrange a security detail for his transportation and observation while he still has one for all on campus. Can't risk him running amok once he's off the quirk suppressants. Understood. Is this really happening? Mina asked hoarsely, something like wonder in her eyes. Is could I really coming home? Don't get too excited, Ashido. Aizawa warned her as he reached for his phone. He's going to be under strict watch until we can either get one for all out of him or he makes peace with his vestige, if that even is what's needed. I'm not wrong about this, Akuturi insisted, looking annoyed at the th idea that his theory was even being questioned. Everything lines up with my hypothesis. Even so, I'm not taking any chances. <sighs> That's fair. I don't care if he's under guard. Mina said as she felt joyous tears beginning to slide out of her eyes. He's coming home. Aizawa turned away to roll his eyes when he noticed that his phone was buzzing. Almost simultaneously, All Might's phone began to ring, leading both men to look at one another with frowns. As they each moved to answer the calls, Eri murmured, Wonder what the chances are that's unrelated. Low, Akuturi answered grimly. This was confirmed when both men's eyes widened, with All Might's jaw hanging open for a few seconds. They what? he gasped. How bad are we talking? Aizawa asked almost simultaneously. Something tells me we should get going, Izuku said, only for Akuturi to move toward the small television in the corner. Hikari, what are you doing? If both of them are getting phone calls that bad, my bet is that it's on the news. He answered over his shoulder while both of the teachers continued to listen with rapt attention to the speakers on the other end of the line. He turned on the TV and quickly changed the channel to one of the more popular news stations. What they saw made him drop the remote, his fingers having gone slack with horror. This just in said the anchor, looking grim in front of a screen that showed a city that had been shrouded in a green fog. Some kind of bioweapon has been released in the Kanto ward, and the chaos is frightening to contemplate. We have yet to be able to get word from anyone on the ground, but aerial surveillance has shown what appears to be massive amounts of damage and casualties caused by the civilians' quirks. 
We're not certain of this, but based on some footage we have from our cameras, it appears that the gas forces people's quirks to go wild, and the results are disturbing. Kanto, Izuku breathed as he looked at Mina and Akaruri, whose faces had turned deathly pale. That's where... Kurai really is... Kurai is somewhere in there. Akaruri finished for him. And if that gas really does force quirks into overdrive, our worst fears are about to be put on HD for the world to see. At that same moment, in a dark room out of sight from the UA, the Paranormal Liberation Front, Humorize, and any other hero agency or criminal syndicate known to the people of Japan, a solitary figure stood amid the soft glow of over a dozen monitors, which were connected to half a dozen different computers of various makes and models. The game has changed, they murmured to themselves even as they observed the different news reports streaming in from a dozen different channels. One in particular seemed to occupy the speaker's attention, because three monitors suddenly cleared to make room for an enlarged image from Channel 23. In it, one could see the stirrings of something like a storm, save that no storm had ever appeared as such before. The figure before the monitors gave vent to a little smile as they noticed sparks of black lightning being thrown skyward, before once again speaking in lowered tones to say, The game has changed, yes. And even the pieces themselves have been altered, but... The rules have returned to working order. Now this I can really work with. A trio of other monitors began to flash with a pilfered street camera footage of the Euro Deku working alongside Ground Zero and Freezer Burn under Endeavor in recent weeks. To the untrained eye, Deku was fighting much the same as he always had when it came to villains, but the eyes resting upon these videos were far from untrained. They saw the lack of verdant lightning that was the result of the young hero's full cowling, despite his continued ability to move and strike at speeds the Ida family would have envied. They saw the subtle yet concentrated glow shimmering around a new pair of gauntlets that had replaced his equipment during his excursion to Nabu Island. With all those subtle hints having been tugging at his attention, the spectator can now smile at the clear signs of all for one's greatest creation and failure having changed hands once again, as they had known it would. The speaker then allowed that smile to grow into a fierce, nearly warlike expression before they growled, Game on, guardian hero. Never took the backseat or wonder What's a dream without a goal to conquer Just a painful reminder I have seen for miles how the river Would you run towards your fears every day? Just to prove that nothing's standing in your way. In the moments I could feel it, when my sacrifice was needed, before they could even see me, I was there like a flash of lightning. All right, so we have reached the end of the do-over chapters yeah we'll call them. yeah so now we're, we're gonna start really trucking forward with those plot points yep we're uh we're, we're hitting the we're hitting the third we're hitting the third movie arc good and proper here mm -hmm. so we we open with a little, little little sad sad emo teenager moment yep um but i mean in all reality it's like oh my gosh oof yeah this was a hard chapter to write not only for the emotional investment but also because like i don't I'm not a girl. I don't understand how girls process things. So a lot of this was guesswork. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'm, Amina and I have very different personalities. And also, I'm not so a typical like, girl. So I'm not really one to speak on that either. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, th this was certainly a challenging chapter to write for multiple reasons. Um, but you know, I don't see that as a reason not to do it. I so. mean, I can definitely be that le level of melodramatic, but I, I didn't deal with it that healthily, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I, um, I really liked being able to do the conversation with Mina and Izuku. Yeah. 
Because I thought that was something that needed to that happen. Because they me... both felt responsible for it in their own way. Yeah, that took me by surprise, and it was kind of needed. Because it was very, like, impromptu, all of a sudden, like, emotional diarrhea from both people, you know? But, it's like, but it was it's important, it needed been, to happen. It's things that, they, things that they've been sitting on, and they know that they've been sitting on it, but they didn't real. I don't think they really even knew that they needed to talk to each other about mm-hmm. it. But, I mean, that's kind of nice because that's kind of what happens sometimes in friendships where you're not even intending to have this conversation, but it just needs to happen, and it does. Yeah. And those those are just kind of the magical moments of friendship. Yeah. Yay. Cute fairy tale theme. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, yeah. But, I mean, I love it, too, because, like, they're working out, and that just happens. You know, they run across each other, and that's where it happens. Yeah. Um, but then we start moving into... Um, ultimate moves, yeah? Uh, the ultimate moves come a little bit oh, later. Okay. The... Uh... Let's see what 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 happened next. Um, let's see. Team they Juniper? were not Team Juniper. Uh, oh wait, you were so they were they're practicing general combat and it's uh, right up, as I see more Ares talking to Deku. Got it. Got it. Um, and I thought, uh, you know, Deku's been getting some general advice uh, on how to control Energon and all that from this point, but I thought it was about time for him to like kind of start. Um, start developing his his actual move set because you know now he's got to play catch up again. Yeah. So he needs a little help. I was and I was like, try, like before I started developing the arc, I was like, okay, I need to know how I'm gonna do this before I mm. before I decide that I'm even going to do it. And then I was like, oh wait a minute, Aerie's like like Aerie can't give him all the technical details of like how he did everything, but at the least she can give him a she, she can give him a play by play on stuff yeah, that she's seen him do. Absolutely. And since he knows how the quirk feels now, he should be able to extrapolate. And of course, that. Deku's gonna just geek just, out. Yeah. Because he's, he's like, like, I get I'm to learn learning, from the future yeah. version of me. I exactly. get to learn from the pro version of me. Exactly. So and I, that. <laughs> and was there's precious. Bakugo in the background. I was like, stop ignoring me. Poor Bakugo. <laughs> That was, that was, like, that was, that was a fun scene, and then I honestly kind of added the Bakugo bit, like, as it, like, like, I was getting ready to close out the scene, and then I realized, like, wait a minute, Bakugo's not gonna take this lying down. What kind of training scene would it be in My Hero Academia if you don't have Sparky Boom Boy being Sparky Boom Boy in the background and getting all angsty and frustrated that... There's a reason that Kurt I called him Ground Zero. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> i just i love it i'm sorry it's let's great. see after that we have uh we have team we have team juniper come in and we get to there expand we on that we got to expand on that a little bit because um in air uh in Aerie's ch- in the in the previous chapter you know Aerie came in um and it was from a different point of view like she she got there and like they had already been in for a minute or something like that um, this time we get to see from Mina's point of view, so we got to expand on the conversations mm-hmm. that were happening, and we get to see uh, Tai Yang and Crow come in, each t- t- each being very funny to me in their own way, because <laughs> Tai Yang just comes in and it's just dad jokes for days. See, as uh, as part of the crowd that still questions the point of including Ruby characters, uh-huh. um, I was just like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, but it does introduce you, reintroduce you to the classes A versus B dynamics, and it gives yes. you a new way of looking at it. Yes. So that's one little positive way of keeping things fresh here. I just had, re- I just was, I really wanted Ida to meet Crow, especially because it's just how opposite they are triggered <laughs> Ida is triggered <laughs> and crow's loving it that's oh, the yeah. kind of that's the kind of anxious attention that people like crow thrive on oh yeah oh yeah he's oh yeah he immediately clocked Ida's like i'm gonna have fun with this uh-huh. <laughs> you can't drink alcohol on campus i don't care Mm-hmm. oh yeah oh he can't wait to put that little turd in his place oh yeah oh yeah uh let's see uh what what else let's see what what else happened. man this is a long chapter i gotta Oof. say uh let's see. yeah it's like 37 yeah, pa- it's like 37 pages like, not on gonna lie guys it. i fell asleep while he was reading it to me not for lack of being interested just because i was tired and it was and long sick, and speech. i was sick yes yeah. let's see um Let's see. The next bit that I thought was really important to happen was Mina finally gets a conversation with Kurt I over the phone where we finally get to see like 
how like we, we've seen him like lead, like being angry at the therapy and then finally leaning mm -hmm. into the therapy now we see how he's like doing with processing all of it and it's a major sigh of relief for her too because she's mm. able to actually hear him and hear where he's at and see that he's like actually making the effort mm -hmm. so all of those intrusive thoughts she's been having can be quieted yeah and i can get that because i mean yeah. oh my gosh yeah. That's, I mean, as someone who's experienced having the love of my life isolated from me in a hospital, like mm -hmm. that is all of the anxiety that ha comes with that. And then you start thinking, oh my gosh, all the what ifs, because mm -hmm. you don't know where they're at. Um, and then being able to hear their voice and know that they're actually improving is just amazing it's mm. a godsend and so mm -hmm. it's it's nice to have that little sigh of relief with her the bit with her like going to his to his closet and like taking some of his taking some of his hoodies that i took off of you because oh. i've seen you i've seen you do it i do it like there, there, there's been a couple times where i have to like be away for sleep study or i'm away for an overnight trip or something and i come back and she's like wearing my stuff oh yeah i'll be on his side of the bed i know daniel calls me on it too he'll be like mommy Whenever daddy's not home, you're on his side of the bed. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I miss him. He's like, but why? <laughs> you know, being a three-year-old, he's just like, but that's not your side of the bed. Why are you here? Why are you using his pillow? <laughs> See, so we got me. This one's a little bit more of a side note, but Mina's uh, perfected her acid avatar, or acid man, as it's called in the English dub. But she's also working on another move um, that... Uh, is not in the anime or manga that I'm that I'm actually coming up with for her. Nice. Um, that I think it, um, it's going to be a little bit more ref uh, it, reflective of her relationship with Kurt. I, I wouldn't say is the right hmm. word, but she wouldn't have taken this route because because if you think about it, Kurt is a lot about precision. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to be given the nature of his power. Yeah. Even now, the one that and he that's has now. not something that comes natural with her quirk mm -mm. at all. No, she's like she kind of like spray and pray. Yeah. Um. Like you know, she 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 gets some precision. And she works on that. She aim. works on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. She does, but not to the degree where it's like almost obsessive. Mm. I say almost obsessive. Um. But that's definitely going to get brought into. And this. that's important too, because I mean, the people you're around are going to sharpen how you develop. Mm -hmm. Like just as a teacher, creating seating charts when you're a kid. You take for granted that your teacher just creates a seating chart. There is a science to it. Mm -hmm. You you take into account grades, demographics, personalities, work ethic. And you think, okay, is this kid going to benefit from being around someone who makes them feel comfortable? Or is this kid going to benefit being around someone who is an overachiever and like because some kids you put them by an overachiever and all and of a just sudden shut down because yeah because they're like oh well i suck i can't do this but then other kids you sit them by the overachiever and they get and competitive they, they get and they get inspired and all of a sudden you have two kids who are doing way better and even the overachiever will start working Has harder to compete. <laughs> because all of a sudden the kid who normally doesn't work hard is keeping up with them mm -hmm. and so but you like as teacher you have to kind of eye that and so when you watch characters who are developing and sharpening each other you have to take into account how they inspire each other Isn't to become that who saying, they are like, show me your friends and i'll show you your future um so it, um oh it's it's uh show me who you walk with and i'll show you who you are it's a spanish proverb okay. let me uh, or tell me who you walk with is is dime oh, here, hold on hold on I'll, I'll find it later okay. but i mean yeah it's it but it, it's the same principle the the people you spend time with are going to inform who you become not only as a person but mm -hmm. like in your skill like at you know also at work if i spend time with the teachers who hate their jobs and just complain all the time i'm gonna be miserable but if i spend time with people who love their craft and want to get better i enjoy what i do Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, you know, and that can be said of anything you do in life. Yeah. And so watching them, like, and watching my, like, for example, my little brother's football team. Mm -hmm. You have a group of kids who are all from kind of rough backgrounds, but you get five or six little boys who are not necessarily naturally talented, but they have a drive. And you stick those little personalities together. And um, these, I watched these boys through middle school play football together. But because those specific personalities stayed together, they went on to win the state championship mm -hmm. and get all get scholarships. And one of them's in the NFL now. 
Yeah, that's um, right. That's yeah, right. I forgot about because that. and but I don't think any of them would have gone very far if they didn't have those specific personalities around each other, sharpening each other. Yeah, and that I, I think that can also be owed to their parents thinking, okay, my kid plays so well with this little group of kids, yeah. and they're they're looking at these ten year olds and thinking we got to keep these kids together, and they did, yeah. and they they like moved districts just to keep these kids together all the way through high school, and it really paid off because most of them got scholarships and you know Jordan yeah. ended up Jordan ended up yeah, playing for the that's for nice. yeah nice. which is amazing um especially from our itty bitty little podunk town where mm. everyone's everyone's small and unathletic <laughs> you know yeah. and so it's just but I mean it also yeah, sharpened like, their personalities and made them realize that they're capable of achieving things right and a lot of kids who graduate from our town she, don't go on to do much but they all did and I'm so proud of them so like so she does this in a more negative sense at the beginning of the chapter where she has this moment where she's like I'm not the same person that I was at the start of this mm. like like she says this in an effort to like keep herself from blaming Kodai for doing the things that he did yeah but she tells herself she's like I'm not the same person that I was when I started this yes and in a way it's also kind of me saying like she's not the same person as what we've seen in the show either mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because these these events have altered like you know it's still Mina Ashido like yeah. through and through but she doesn't re but but she doesn't she won't react to stuff the exact same way that as the one that we're that we're used to seeing in the show yep well, and I mean, that's, it goes, all goes back to that same thing. You know, you write these stories to, just, to examine these ripple effects. Mm -hmm. You don't want to totally just all of a sudden recreate a character overnight, kind of like they were saying in the reviews. You don't want to just all of a sudden take Dad Zawa to a level where he's no longer Aizawa, yeah. right? But you have to realistically look at like, okay, this personality, if this personality experienced X, Y, and Z, how would that affect them? How would they act differently? You know, that whole nature versus nurture thing. And naturally, Aizawa has his personality yeah but he's being put in the shoes of being responsible for these children so mm -hmm. he has a certain level of authority and dadness mm -hmm. that comes along with it but he's still who he is as a person right and so i think there's just all of these little details that you have to pay attention when you're carving out these personalities mm -hmm. you don't want to yeah. lose sight of who you're writing about that yeah, that, keeping track of all that is one of the harder aspects, mm. especially writing uh, shonen inspired stuff because there's so many characters to keep track of. Yeah, but you know it's it's a challenge, and I am I'm willing to take it on. It's interesting. Do you think that you have to have a certain level of empathy in order? Yes, because yes, I I feel like you have to really think deeply about how another person would feel in a certain situation. Yeah. yeah. That is especially difficult for people who are so different to my personality. Mm. Like for Kurt, I, you know, he's he's very different from me in a lot of respects, but there's there are, some similarities. There, there's, there's some similarities, so that makes it easier for me to relate to him. Mina, like the similarities between me and Mina is that I like talking to people, and that's about it. Like her and I are <laughs> her and I are very different in oh, many yeah. other aspects. So like, it's very difficult for me to empathize with her, but I'm trying to do it. I'm trying yeah. to do my best anyway. Yeah, she's like drastically different from both of us so it's hard mm. for me to relate to Mina too so it's aside from situational things that I've experienced yeah. you know yeah. and so her responding to things she almost never responds to the thing to things the way I would yeah and so as I like that you're you're going into it looking at her as a character and you know kind of whittling her out yeah. of this you know because this nebulous thing because you didn't come up with the character you have to think about okay but what these are the, the circumstances. Yeah. These are the but these circumstances have changed her into this. Mm -hmm. instead. Yeah, exactly. What did you think of? Uh, what did you think of Kurt and I meeting uh, meeting Ray? It took me for, by surprise, and at first I was like, ah, too big of a coincidence. But you know, at the same time, it makes. He's sense. been there for like a month. Also. You know, I, like when I first, when you first told me, I was like, well, why would they be at the same hospital? Well, it makes sense because, first of all, she would be at a very high profile, expensive hospital because mm -hmm. the world, you know, Japan's number two hero, now number, now one, number one, It he's got bucks. And so he can pay for the best of the best, mm -hmm. right? And of course, Kurai is coming from UA. And he's a really high profile person. So it would make sense that with the circumstances they could end up at the same facility yeah like this wasn't like him being hospitalized in a mental institute him meeting ray was not the point but once i realized the circumstances were leading to that i was like i can work i was like i like that i'm able to work this mm -hmm. in 
And it gives you a nice little segue into this new plot twist. Yeah. Like, before we get to that, though, like, I... I wanted to have, like, you know, he has, like, he's been able to talk to his mom only a couple times over the last few months. So, like, mm -hmm. he's, like, obviously he's not going to stop, he's not going to look at Ray as a mom figure, but he needed a mom to talk to, I think. Yeah. Okay. Like, I see it. I like, see I, it. I, I think that's something that his character needed at this point in time. Okay. I hadn't thought about it that way. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, again, like, again he's not going to look at her as a maternal figure, but, you know, she is a mom. And you, every once in a while, you know... Boys need a mom to talk to. Everybody needs a mom to talk to. Are you kidding me? I have so many adopted moms in this life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So that was, that was a, like, again, it wasn't the point. But once I realized I could make it a thing, I was really glad to be able to flesh it out the way that I was. Nice. That's I, cool. I mean, I thought it was a good interaction. If I'm being honest, I was asleep when you were reading this to me and I woke up when the bomb went off. Oh, that's funny. Basically, she talk like basically she talks about how like Shoto has written to Sh Shoto's written to her about him. Okay. Because like, you know, like if you remember this version of the Sports Festival, you know, Deku still got Todoroki to light his fire, but Kurai was the one who got him to keep it lit mm. essentially. So they talk about that. One of those weird moments where you meet your friend's mom and they're not there and you have the conversation about them without them and it's just yeah. kind of it's kind of cool but it's kind of weird. That's the vibe I'm getting. But he's well, she's she's like you know he's still she, she's talking to she's like you know she he still admires you. And Kurai's talking. He's like, well, I don't. He's like, he shouldn't. He's like, you know, I'm not going to be here anymore. And Ray takes that moment to talk to him and be like, you know, just because you're not going to be here anymore, that doesn't mean that people will stop respecting mm. you for what you've already done. See, for me, it's hard for me to picture Shoto opening up to his mom at that level. First of all, because he's a teenage boy. Um, and second of all, because he's Shoto. But I think it's sweet that it he It has been shown that. that he is, like, emotionally much closer to his mother. Also, moms are just intuitive like that. So whether he's told her or not, I think she can put two yeah. and two together. She, yeah, like, Shoto's told her, like, how much he respects Kurai and, like, everything that he's done for them. And like and why he admires him, and cool. she can extrapolate from that. All right. Um. But yeah, then the then the bomb goes off, and uh, before anybody shouts at me too much for altering the movie plot, I will say that I planted the Easter egg for this at the end of the second movie when we had humorized looking at Japan and being like, "Hey, they're in a state of turmoil right now." It was like if we if we set off a bomb there, you know, it's gonna be way it, it, like it's gonna do way more to their morale. Like it's gonna, it's gonna, it's like it's gonna be way, it's like it's gonna be way more impactful if we shut it off there than if we just detonated in this, you know, backwater country, okay. essentially. So I did. So like this is not, this is not out of left field. I I did I did set I did set up for this a few chapters. Yeah, back. I mean it is a really big bold move because mm -hmm. generally when you see terrorist groups, you'll see them kind of testing the waters in smaller places. So we see in the show, but... we see in the show there was an episode where, that covered uh, Uraraka and Asui's internship with uh, with Ryukyu again. Yeah, it was a beach episode. And they the the smugglers that they were that they were dealing with were smuggling. That's trigger. right. Mm -hmm. So they've already been, and, and like yeah, and Flecht was there like at the oh. end of it. So he was in Japan. So okay. like so like so like this is not this is absolutely not out of the realm okay. of possibility for it to have happened. All right. So um, see for me, I wouldn't have criticized because. I get your cannon mixed up with the real cannon <laughs> in general, and I forgot that it hadn't gone off in Japan. So... Nope, went off in Ophion first. Oh, see? I don't even know. Yeah. I don't even know. But yeah, so like, th that in and of itself, along with circumstances being what they were in my story, was like, yeah, I feel like this is something they would, they would do. Is it pushing it? Maybe a little bit, but I don't think it's honestly enough to take anybody out of the story. You're having too much fun to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm well, having that fun. That being said, I mean, I think that's about it. That's, I mean, I don't know. Do you want do you want to talk about that that last the, 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 the we well we finally have Akari putting all the pieces together mm -hmm. on uh, we have Akari putting all the pieces together concerning one for all. Mm -hmm. Why Kurai hasn't been able to talk to the vestiges and all that? Yeah. So like that was important. That was important. Which somebody I think a couple of people actually predicted that this was that this yes. was the case. Yes. In which case I salute you. You were correct. Um, but yeah, Akari's finally put it together. He's like, he's like, he's like, he's whacking himself. He's like, how did I see this sooner? Um, so yeah, they're getting ready for Kurt to come home and then, um, gas bomb goes off. And, and then. Care to unpack what the heck is happening here at the end? It's a, uh, it's a new villain. <laughs> it's yeah. a new villain. I mean, hey, I mean, Silver, Silver loved the last one so much. I figured I might as well do it again. 
New villain. <laughs> well, here's your Easter egg, friends. Yes, yes. And this... I'm afraid to say anything because I don't want to yeah, spoil this villain it. Is, this villain's going to be something else. Well, I'll tell you what. well, you guys will see. There's This is the reason I threw a Rubik's Cube at my husband. Yeah, they did something that Becca did not like. So I got very. You guys upset. are either go you guys are either gonna love this or hate this. Bit. Like generally, you guys have the more impassioned responses to his plot. Twists. I am going to be very surprised if anybody yells at me more than Becca did about this one. Yeah, I I, I held a grudge for a few weeks, if mm. not a few months. Um, mm -hmm. I still am a little salty about it. A little. Yeah. No. This villain is. The, the, oh man, yeah. Just, yeah. just, just continue. You'll yeah, enjoy I'll it. Yeah, I'll continue. All right, All right, yeah, yeah. You guys, yeah. I think we'll you guys will enjoy. We'll I think you guys that. will enjoy it. I think you guys will enjoy it when it happens. All right. Um, but I think that's what we got for now. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the new video. That's the new closing for the coming phase. And I will close this video off by saying, wishing you guys a plus ultra couple of weeks <laughs> and encouraging you to stick around for the. Uh, new opening that will be debuting we, a full next chapter. Will we maybe do next chapter next week since we're yes. a week late? Yeah. Yes. We're so we're going to do it. Yeah. Schedule. So next week. So we'll have a double chapter. So if you're going to leave a review, try, if you want it to be in the podcast, try to do it the next week because we're going to try to get back on schedule pending me not getting any weird, more weird kid viruses. Sounds good. <laughs> Hope you guys have a plus ultra couple of weeks and stick around for the next video. See ya. I've been wandering in my mind lately I've been looking for a place to rest my head For the road that lies ahead Always fighting for the ones beside me You could try it but her heart's so far from dead You will believe it